review course. Unfortunately, Dr. Mustafa Ghalwa shall not be able to start the introduction. So we'll start with Dr. Muhammad Abdel Gawai. Dr. Muhammad, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope that today's uh, session will be uh, fruitful and uh, uh, you will benefit from it. Uh, we will start, we'll start by introduction. Uh, we will cover uh, the, concept, the CPHQ uh, exam, uh, how to register, uh, what are the types of questions that you might face uh, if you went to the exam for 15 minutes. Uh, then I will continue with you uh, to discuss leadership and strategic plan development uh, chapters. Um, and then we will have a break at 10.30. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Chaukri will uh, start presenting the information management chapter uh, for almost one hour, and then we will take another break. Uh, I will come again to uh, tell you how to talk to you about performance improvement. Then, in the last break at three thirty to uh, at one thirty to two uh, p.m., and then Dr. Ahmed will finalize the day uh, by uh, talking about vision safety. So we will start uh, by the introduction as we said today we are going to provide a concept an overview about the cph certification exam and the chapters of the uh, exam or of the content outline and how to understand uh, the dimensions of cphq uh, certificate okay so we will guide you on uh, examination how to go and register for the exam we will identify uh, tips to prepare for the exam and we will uh, identify what are the resources that you might use in order to uh, study uh, CPHQ. CPHQ exam exams will be based on uh, practice and analysis. It, it has been designed according to uh, a survey in order to identify what is important for healthcare quality professional. What are the main subjects that a healthcare quality professional has to do? And then they developed the outline. Okay. The content is being reviewed every three months, the three years, and it is updated every three years. And you can uh, check, and we will see now how to check the content outline to identify what are the latest outline of CPSQ content. Uh, it has four uh, dimensions or four chapters. Organizational leadership, we sometimes say that management and leadership, performance and process improvement, health data analytics or health uh, or information management, and at last, patient safety. The exam is 140 questions, but you will be scored according to only 125 questions because Always there are 15 questions that are experimental. It, they are not included in the equation uh, for the person uh, not passing the exam. However, it is there in order to see how the candidates are responding to, this question, to these questions and if it will be included in future exams or not. You will not identify the 15 experimental questions. So when you are going for the exam, you will answer 140 uh, questions. Uh, here are the distribution of the chapters. Each chapter has uh, a specific number of questions that has to be there. The management and leadership, uh, 35 questions. Performance improvement, 14 questions, and this uh, 40 questions, and this is the, the biggest share. Data analytics, information management, 30, and at last, uh, patient safety, 20 uh, questions. So we have to cover and to understand all concepts of the chapters in order to be able to answer the questions in the exam. As I told you, we have 15 pre-tests and 125 that are uh, scored. You will be scored against 125 questions. Uh, there are three types of questions in the exam. All of the exam uh, is, is uh, uh, multiple choice MCQ. 23% uh, only of the questions or recourse. He will be examining your uh, ability to memorize and to understand and to recall a concept. If we are talking about what is PDSA, 
what PDSA stands for, when do we use PDSA? So one of the answers will be performance improvement. So this is a simple, straightforward recall, and it, it has to reflect the ability to memorize based on understanding, of course, but ma mainly recall. The biggest chair is the application. In the application, he will put you in a situation and he will give you answers. According to the situation, you will choose what is the right answer and what is the right response that you have to do at this situation. You might find more than a correct answer in the multiple uh, choices. However, we use the most appropriate one for the situation. So it is not about uh, that only one answer is right. Yes, you will be scored, of course, for only one answer, but you have to clearly read the question and understand it because you will apply if you are in real life and you are in this situation, what you will do. And the last part, uh, is the analysis. And the analysis usually is giving you a problem, a graph, and then he is identifying your ability on how to work on this graph, understand the information from it or from the equation, and then how to apply. So it's some sort of application, but based on analysis. So as you know, as, and as you see now, you don't have to memorize the content, you have to understand it. And if you understand it and you integrate the information of the content outline, you will be able to analyze and to apply to your work and accordingly to the exam. How to schedule your exam? Of course, because we are here in uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, all uh, outboard, you know, CPHQ is an American exam. It is designed and uh, organized by an institute named National Association for Healthcare Quality. This association developed the candidate outbook, handbook, uh, the content outline, and they have a website, nahq.org. As stated here, uh, here is number one. You will go uh, for nahq.org, and then you will just uh, put your cursor on individuals. And when you put your cursor in, on individual, you will find a drop-down list. From the drop-down list, you will choose apply for the exam. So when you apply for the exam, you have two options. Either is to be from USA or outside or outboard. So you will choose international candidate. When you choose your international candidate, you will find that you have a specific window for registration and accordingly for the exam. We have four windows for the exam. One starts at the 13th of uh, March till the 26th of March. Okay. And if you want to go for this exam, you have to finish your application before February 14th. Though. So the application period, so we have two windows. The first window is the application period. And once the application period close, uh, if you manage to register during this period, you will be able to enter the exam window, the next exam window. So let's take an example. Now we are on uh, November. So now we can go for the March uh, exam window, okay? Because the registration and the application period now is open from November 13 till February 14, 2022. So, we have from now till the mid of February, we can register and apply for the exam. Okay. If you did not make it, you can go for the next window and it will be starting after this close. So it will be February 15 till May, uh, the 9th of May, and the exam will be on June. And as you can see, the uh, windows uh, comes the same pattern. You have an application period and then you have an exam window. Uh, the cost of the exam, accordingly, if you are an HEQ uh, member or non-member, the membership is almost one hundred dollars. So, if you are a member, you will. If you want to be a member, you will pay one hundred dollar, almost one hundred dollars. You will be a member. Accordingly, you will ha be having a deduction on the fees or the cost of the exam. So, if you became a member, you will pay. $473, and if you are not a member, you will pay $529. Uh, the, 
the benefit of being member, the, they are they are publishing some journals or papers, and if you go for any product of an uh, HQ like their book or their preparation guide, you will take a reduction as well. So it's up to you if you are confident that you are going to go for the exam and pass pass from the first time. <clears throat> so you will pay the five hundred twenty nine, and that's it. Okay. On the day of the test for the online, you have to test your computer. When you schedule, he will be sending you a link, and this link you will have to uh, set up a special uh, browser. And this special browser, you have to test it at least 72 hours uh, before the exam. Okay, uh, You have to be in a quiet, closed room without interruptions. And uh, you will be sitting on a disk, and this disk has to be completely clean. No papers, no pens, nothing, no pencil even. And you should bring your ID. Uh, it is preferable to be your uh, passport. And then uh, the browser automatically open your camera. And you will find a proc tool on the other side who is, will be following you all over the exam. OK? He will ask you to screen your room, to screen under your table, and to be sure that you don't have any uh, book or any paper or any body with you in the uh, in the room. Then he will orient you on how to use the software and how to use the system. Uh, and he will be there, as I'm uh, telling you. Uh, you. You are not allowed to put your hand in your mouth or to cover your face. The camera has to be on all the time. And he will be giving you uh, tips and uh, information all over the exam. The exam is a three hours uh, period. Okay. Uh, you will have uh, the timeline or the time of the exam on the bottom, bottom of, the of the screen. And if you have a question that you want to skip, uh, you want, you don't not want to answer it now, you can click on a checkbox, uh, skip question, and then it will come at the end of the exam. Okay, uh, so pace yourself and practice well. Okay, uh, here's some tips for the exam. Anticipate the end and the answer, then look for it. Read the question clearly, understand the question, then think about what is the answer, is the answer and search, with, uh, search for the answer in the multiple uh, choices. When you are reading the question, Kindly concentrate on words such as except, not, least, okay? And be aware of choices such as always and never. Because if you say always and never, you have to be 100% sure that your answer applies to every situation or it will never apply to the situation. Uh, if you have ob obvious wrong answer, you have to exclude and then try to relate each option to the question, to the question. Uh, and this is a, a very important thing, balance options against each other. Because I told you, you might find two answers or three answers that might be a good answer for the question. So you have to identify which is better, which is uh, more righteous answer than the other one. Uh, try to think logic and then consider alternative to choose the best uh, answer. Okay, we have two major or uh, very famous resources to study uh, the content outline for of CTHQ. The first one is uh, HQ Solutions, and this is the product of uh, NAHQ, uh, the same organization that organized the exam. They have their product, which is HQ Solutions. Now they have the fourth edition. It has been published at uh, the beginning of this year. And we have another one. Uh, an old one, actually, Healthcare Quality Handbook uh, for Janet Brown. Uh, this is very famous as well, a big uh, book. And now it is the 13th uh, edition. Uh, you can check their website. They have uh, uh, questions, they have mock exams, uh, and they are available. And you might go for practice exam. You have to buy, to buy this. Uh, in order to practice on the system and the, the, the computer format. It is the same format that you will go for the exam, so my, you might uh, go and try the practice exam. Uh, read the, the content outline, and you might find 
and additional uh, resources uh, according to the uh, topic. Here is the sample of the question. Uh, you will find, as you can see, uh, a big question. Uh, you have to read it carefully. A number of specialty and, and primary care clinicians have participated in several meetings to develop clinical practice guidelines for the management of the diabetes. A team leader has moved a team through the actual guideline development. Which of the following sequence of steps should the team consider in developing the quality of care product evaluation phase? So he will give you answers, identify medical review criteria, identify sampling methods to use, by the test, identify population. Here you can see the sequence. Accordingly, you have the, the headline and you have the questions, then you will correlate what are the steps. This are equal, this is a equal question. It is not, you, he's not applying anything. Actually, there are identified steps and you have to recall for it, okay? That's it, we finished our uh, introduction. Uh, and I have, uh, I saw someone is raising his hand. I'm not sure is it uh, by mistake or it is intended. Uh, so if no questions, we can, or, we can keep the question after the first part, okay? Now we will be starting the, our first topic, which is leadership, management and leadership, okay? Praise yourselves because we have a lot to share now. Okay, as I told you, we have four chapters, management and leadership, process improvement and performance management, health information or data uh, or information management and patient safety. Now we will start by uh, management and leadership. In this chapter, we will know or understand what are the activities that support organizational commitment to quality. We will describe strategic planning related to quality. How are we going to align our quality and patient safety activities and strategic goals. We will describe how to engage our stakeholders. We will identify the role of quality in supporting governing body in credentialing and quality oversight, facilitate development of quality structure, evaluate and integrate the best practice. Okay, let's start by asking a question. Healthcare organization, is it a simple, a straightforward, uh, industry or it's a little bit complicated. I think everyone agree that healthcare industry is a complex environment. It has a diversity of uh, elements. It has a wide variety of elements. We have the patient, we have the MOH, we have CCHI, we have uh, insurance companies, we have suppliers, we have staff, different kinds of staff. We have full-time, part-time, we have cooperative, we have uh, somebody who might come from uh, another country to perform an operation and then go away. We have contracted services. So it's very complex. And we have a wide variety of, uh, of elements. Uh, and this means that significant number of elements are there, which is creating a high level of complexity. So this is the first uh, thing about healthcare organization. We have to understand what the healthcare organization in order to understand how to be a manager or how to manage this uh, environment uh, and how to work uh, in the management and uh, leadership. So the first thing, it's a complex uh, environment. The, the second thing that it is adaptive. What is adaptive? What is adaptation? It's the capability of change and the ability to learn from experience. When we face a situation in healthcare, we have to understand what went right and what went wrong. And we have to have to identify lesson learned in order to be better the next time, or if we have any deficiencies, it should not reoccur. So we are an adaptive system. We adapt with the patient differences, with the patient preferences. We might have a pathway, one, two, three, four, and this pathway might be 
change it according to the patient condition, according to the patient preferences, according to the patient situation, according to our capabilities. So this agility and this adaptation has to be there. Then it's a system and a definition of the system. It's an irregularly interacting or interdependent group of items forming a whole. So it's a system. We have different departments. We have different um, locations. Uh, we have different entities and all of them are working together, forming a whole. Okay, and this whole is our hospital or our healthcare delivery system. Okay, so CAS theory, complex adaptive theory, states that according to this environment, we have three important characteristics. We agree that healthcare system is complex adaptive system. So because it's complex adaptive system, it has independent agents. What is independent agents? We don't have dependent personnel. If a nurse is in OR, so she is independent at that moment to act or to practice. The patient in triage room, she is independent to take actions. The physician in the ER, he will not wait to ask his supervisor on what to do. He has to be acting independently. So these, those various agents in the system has the ability to respond differently, which holds a high level of innovation and creativity and error. As far as that we, they are independent, so they might improvise. And this improvising might go into an innovative or creative idea or error. And by the way, now we are not saying that this is good or bad, but this is these characteristics are there because we are a complex adaptive system and because we have multiple agents, we have two enormous number of staff. So this is expected. So this is the first one. Accordingly, we have distributed control. We cannot have a manager all the time. We cannot have a manager 24 hours, seven days, 265 days a year. Will manager always be there? No, he will not. So we have a distributed control. It is not like we will wait till tomorrow to take a decision when the manager comes. No, it will not go that way. At a lot of situations, a senior staff will be a manager. He will be leader. He has to act separately, as we said, independently. So we have distributed control. And we have non-linearity. What is non-linearity? That our, our outcome are, cannot be predicted by summing up our resources. In healthcare, one plus one does not always equals two. It might equals one and a half and one might equals three. How? According to the skill, according to the knowledge, according to the situation, according to the response of the patient. We are not engineer. Engineering, in engineering, we have one and one equals two. It is simple. But in healthcare, it is different. In healthcare, we it is more helpful to think that we are a farmer than, rather than an engineer. This is very important quote. Engineer design every detail of the system. Farmers know they can do only so much. They will do whatever they know about according to the best practice or according to their knowledge. And then they will wait. They create a condition that improve the probability of uh, developing or uh, reaching an outcome. However, they cannot be sure that the outcome will be there. That's what we do in healthcare. We work according to the clinical practice guidelines, according to our current professional best practice, and we do whatever is level of care in compliance with these best practice in order to be or reach the most desired outcome. We want to increase the probability of having a desired outcome. Again, we are not saying that this is good or bad, but this is the culture and this is the environment that we are dealing with every day. Okay, so we said it's a system, and as I said, it's a regularly interacting interdependent group of items forming a unified group. And accordingly, we need to have a system thinking. What is system thinking? System thinking is like looking at the big picture. If you are working in such a hectic environment, if you are deep into details, you will not see the correlation. Do you know the difference between the ant look and the hawk look? The ant 
is just seeing the next step under her feet. But the hawk from the sky up there, he can explore everything. And then he has the ability to go down and then to go up. That's what we need from manager in healthcare. We should have a system thinking. They should see the interrelationships between these enormous elements of this system. Okay. So the benefits of system thinking, as I said, to be able to see the big picture. Do you know the, there is a funny story about an elephant and uh, they brought an elephant into a room and they uh, brought some people and they covered their eyes. And everyone has to touch uh, a certain piece from the elephant and describe what is an elephant. So the person who uh, took his nose, and I don't know what is the right, uh, but I know that you understand me. He said it's a tube. And who got his tail said it's a rope. Elephant is a rope. And who uh, put his hand on the trunk, he said elephant is a wall. So everyone is saying only his part or is describing only his part. But whoever is seeing the big picture will understand that everyone is only describing an element of the picture. But if he's seeing the big picture, he will understand what is elephant. So we have to understand what is elephant by system thinking. It helps us to facilitate and to identify what are the major component. Again, if you have a system thinking, if you look at the big picture, you will see what has the major impact, what is has the major component and what is irrelevant, what is small. And you will face this a lot. We might be sitting in a meeting discussing a problem in insurance about one day extra. And then when you will, will go for the data, you will find that this one day extra represent 2% of your population. If you're having a big picture, if you're looking at the whole uh, situation, not going into just details, you will see what is major and what is minor. Okay, so you will be able again to identify the relationships. Okay, how this process impact another process, how it will impact the overall. And accordingly, you will be avoiding to have an excessive attention to a single part. You will not be drawn into details of a certain single part, as I told you, the example of the 2% of the insurance rejection and forget about other uh, important uh, parts. If you have all of this, you will have a broad scope solution because you see the interrelationship, you understand what are the major components. So if you are searching for a solution of the problem, you will be able to find a better solution and a broad scope solution. And if you see the interrelationship or the relationships between the segments or the elements of the system, you will be easily can foster integration between these systems. Okay, right. So we have complex adaptive system and we said that we have a complex adaptive system. So how, what is the difference between characteristics of leaders between complex adaptive system and traditional system, a regular system like a company that opens at 9 a.m. and closed at 6 p.m. Okay. And the work can wait for the next day. We do not have that urgency of taking actions and decisions at any time. Okay, traditional system value positions. Okay, because hierarchy there is important. They follow a tight structure. Okay, however, in complex adaptive system, we value persons and relationships. Okay, use loose coupling. We use almost coupling and loose coupling because usually we will not be working all of the time together. We don't have a tight structure. A nurse and the physician is working today for a complete shift and then he might not see her till next week, till next month. So we have coupling, but it is not a tight structure that one person has to report to, report to another one all the time. So the traditional system is, we need to simplify all the time. However, the complex adaptive system, we need to complicate because we need to link between uh, elements and uh, each others between each other and in the traditional system we make decisions but in complex adaptive system we make sense 
we have to understand what is logical, what is sensible to the current situation and accordingly you take actions. In the traditional system, we do planning according to the forecasting because we can easily forecast what is next. In healthcare, we try to do this, but we cannot forecast easily. So we have a vision about the future. We think about the future, but you cannot easily uh, forecast what is coming because a lot of variables, as we said earlier. In the traditional system, they are controlling. We said we have a strict structure. We have hierarchy. hierarchy. So the leader is controlling everyone under every one of his subordinates. However, in healthcare, we are collaborating. Even the top management, even the leaders of the hospital are collaborating with other persons. So those are yeah, examples of the definition of the differences. But we can uh, sum it up into that the traditional system needs somebody who is managing these people, who has a command. However, in complex adaptive system, we have someone who is leading those people, who, who is respecting the value and the relationship, because you know that he cannot be there all the time. So he, they have to be collaborative. He has to listen and learn. So which is better? Leadership or management, both are important. However, in healthcare, in complex adaptive system, leadership traits has to be more than management traits. Okay, and here is the, the difference between successful leader and successful manager. As we said, successful leader is leading change, is trying to find the correct direction, okay, focus on the future. However, the manager is focusing on the present. The leader is introducing the change and the manager is bringing the change into predictability, uh, predictability, sorry into predictability. So he's trying to bring the uh, change into practice. So you will find that the leader is, is concerned about developing a vision of change, aligning the subsystems, how to collaborate together, how to cooperate with it together. However, the management will be coping with planning, budgeting, staffing, organizing, and etc. So successful leader, he is an advocate for a change. He produced change often, often dramatically. However, the manager, as we said, he brings uh, predictability and order for the change. A, a successful leader always actively demonstrates support and trust, and the successful manager monitor and evaluate employees' uh, work. So, if you remember a leader and try to think of a leader in your uh, in your history of work. And most of the time, you will find that you have been connected to this to, to this leader uh, by relationship more than uh, professional work. You might do extra work for him because you trust him and he supports you. However, the manager is good. He is successful, but he is more routine. He is more uh, traditional. And in complex adaptive system, as we said, we do not we need, we need a different approach. Here is the characteristics of a leader. He is intimate with the organization and its work. He has to be passionate for the work. He has to see the big picture and the broad picture. He has to be a spokesperson and diplomat, and this is important. And, and you will find in the next uh, the next one, he has to be a storyteller. If he is a storyteller, he if he can describe something and he's a spokesperson, people will follow him. And if we can uh, figure out uh, a leader, uh, an important leader, we have uh, the most successful leader in the history is the Prophet Muhammad. And he, if you apply these items on him, you will find everything about him, uh, about leadership in his character or in, in, in his actions. Another example from uh, other place, Yani. And again, leader has people follow the leader. He has to be, as I told you, storyteller. One of the leaders that he is a leader, even he was evil leader, Hitler. Hitler managed to move all his people from one place to another place, from an economic crisis to a huge, huge country. So he is a leader. He was very good spokesperson. 
okay he was a very good storyteller okay so a leader has to tell why rather than how and this is very important for anybody who want to work in healthcare quality telling why rather than how the intent of what we do is more important of how are we going to achieve it when you deal with a standard okay let's say hand over okay or critical result reporting we always talk about how to implement this standard but the most important is why do we implement this standard because if we understand why do we implement this standard it will be more easy to find on how because how differs from one hospital to another but why is always the same we have to report critical results reporting we have to report critical result because it has a risk on the patient and we need an immediate action accordingly we have to see how to reach this immediate action how to reach this immediate communication way how to ensure that this immediate communication has been recorded so that's it we said why accordingly we will find how understand and speaks for the corporate value system and adopt participative management and later we will talk about what is participative uh, management he has to to have consistent integrity and the integrity is doing things when nobody is looking saying a thing and doing another thing when nobody is there is not integrity so integrity is to be consistent is to have a situation that is not will not be changed according to persons or according to situations different situation a uh, leader usually love to have heterogeneity and diversity he asks for different opinion he is open to contrary opinion and he is vulnerable to skill and talent of others if a leader find out a talented person he is very weak to this talented person he go for him he try to support him he is not the person who will find a talented uh, employee and try not to use him okay so what are the styles of leadership now now we talked about the leadership and the characteristics of leadership what are the styles of leadership do we have different style approaches for leadership yes sometimes we have autocratic leadership and the autocratic leadership he takes he makes decisions and announces them okay when yani yeah, according to what we said autocratic or bureaucratic is not the perfect leader however in some situation we need to be that way if we have a crisis okay or if we have a uh, let's say an a patient error that led to death and we might be exposed into the media we are not going to sit and try to find opportunity uh, opinions and or diversity we need a quick action here we need somebody to take a quick and decisive decision this action or this approach is named autocratic we have diplomatic and diplomatic consultative is a good seller he identify a decision and he decide already and then he can be able to sell his decision to his subordinate why don't we come one hour early it will you will benefit and the work will be productive and uh, we might have time more time for break uh, if you just increased one so he will he, he already decided that we will come one hour early however he tried to convince his subordinate about the, this is the dip, diplomatic uh, type participatory which is our as a healthcare quality professional this has to be our way okay of uh, dealing with uh, things we have to draft an idea what is a draft of an idea an option we will offer the idea as an option and then we will discuss receive the suggestion from everyone and then the leader again he will make the decision but based on what is best for the organization so it is not democratic because we will now see the, the difference between this and the democratic the participatory he has a, a solution but he will discuss with his team about the solution and find out what are their uh, opinions and then he will make the final decision the democratic will not state any solutions he will de detail the problem and then he will ask his subordinates or the group to take a decision okay that's the democratic and 
the uh, majority will uh, make uh, the decision. The last one is the free rhyme. This is not the last one, the, this is the no limits, okay? It's just like uh, those who work in Google. Uh, they have no limits. They can come whenever they like. They can work from home and from the office, but they are very uh, talented. They are very creative. So we, we do not want to have limits on them, okay? So the free rhyme is usually used when, uh, when you have a group of highly intellectual people uh, or employees, and you know, we want their creativity more than their discipline. So there is no limit here. We have two important uh, other uh, leadership style. One moment, please. The transactional and transformational. Transactional is working on reward, reward and punishment. Okay, he is more like an autocratic. Okay, however, he adds some rewards. So. He will go and describe what is the best uh, behavior, how to be complying with this behavior. Then he will uh, focus on the outcome. Whoever is complying, he will give him a reward. So this is a transactional, and the transaction is not a perfect, but sometimes we use it. The transformational, and the transformational is an inspiring one, uh, and he can be a very good mentor. He inspires people to go for their goals. He recognize their potential and try to support them in order to reach their accomplishment. Right. What is the exemplary leader? What is the perfect leader? What are the steps in order to be a, an, an example as a leader? First of all, you have to challenge the process. Then inspire the shared vision. I will go through it and then I will stop at each one again. Inspire shared vision, model the way, enable others to act, and then encourage the heart. What is challenging the process? He has to ask question about the current status. He has to check the status quo. <clears throat> Let's say that I will give you an example. When yeah, like uh, seven years earlier or more than even seven years, I had a manager or a leader and he came and said, he, he was, we, was, we were reviewing the policies and procedure and we had the policy and procedure with tons of words and the policy might reach 20 pages. And then he said, he asked, he challenged this process. Do you understand what is written? He goes around and asks the, the staff, have you ever read the whole policy? Do you understand what is the procedure from this policy? Accordingly, he found that he convinced everyone that the current status of these policies are not good, are not going to take us into a good place. The next, he inspired a shared vision. He said that we need to cut these policies into a half, okay? So everyone will work into groups in order to minimize the volume of these policies and make it simple, okay? Then he modeled the way. What is modeling the way is walk the talk, is doing a thing that you are advocating for it. I remember that we were in a meeting and then he was uh, telling us a story about his last day and how he went out and met friends and had fun. And he said a very short statement. And then he asked us, did you understand what I said? Uh, and everyone said, yes, we understand. But he, he told us, I'm training myself to state a, a, a statement, to say a statement in five words instead of eight words. So I'm trying to be short and I want to be sure that you understand. Me. And that was in a meeting that we were just about to open a policy and try to find it. So he by himself is saying something and doing it. It is not only bragging about doing, saying something and be, it is not being, too, uh, being applied. The best way of teaching your uh, children how to read is to read by yourself, not to tell them, go read. If he find you, saying to all the time, go read and you are not, so he will never do it. But if you said reading is important and they find yourself practicing this, he will be conv convinced that this is important and he will convince it that you have integrity. Then enables others to act. You will find who 
need support, who need help in this? Who should I work with him closely to train him, train him on uh, the current the, or the new process? And at last, if we reach it, our target, we have to encourage the Lord. If we manage to uh, finalize our policies that way, the first team who will do it, uh, we will have a special dinner with the CEO and with the leadership in order to celebrate his success. So it's, it's encouraging the heart, celebrating the good moments and the achievement is important to be a good leader. So those are the steps. Now we're going to, say, to talk about the strategic uh, management. Please um, uh, note that we finished now the part of the leadership. We talked about the uh, types of leadership. Why do we need a, a leadership? Because of the complex adaptive system and because the environment of the uh, healthcare uh, delivery. And then we talked about the types of leaders, how, uh, what are the characteristics of leaders and uh, how to be uh, an exemplary leader and what are the steps for being exemplary. Now we are going to try to link this into strategic management. In strategic management or strategic planning, we should have strategic leadership. Okay, so what are the steps of the strategic management or strategic planning and how to be an exemplary leader or a strategic leader through this process? First of all, we have to say that strategic planning is identifying what are we doing now? What the world around us is moving, how it is moving, Accordingly, where do we want to go next? Leadership and top management has to get to set together and to understand their performance and to understand the challenges around them. Accordingly, they will identify where to go in the next three to five years. What are our targets and our goals that we want to, to achieve? So here are the steps. The first of all, what organization want to do? We have to define and formulate goals. How to do that? How to define and formulate goals? First, we will ask ourselves what organization should do. And should do is according to the external environment. Okay. What are the updates in the laws and regulation? The transformation uh, project of the uh, uh, KSA. 2030 uh, vision, okay? <clears throat> what nafis and the changes in the, the CCHI rules and regulations, uh, the change in the demographic of the, uh, of the country, having different type of foreigners. In 2017, we had an incident of applying the fees on the, uh, those who are um, aliens with the, with the worker and we found that a lot of people went to their country so the demographic was changing at this point at a certain point we have to sit together and to see what are the challenges what are the external environment do we have a new com competitor or not let's say now we have we are expecting so we are expecting other hospital to be around us so how are we going to deal with this then what organization can do the other or what organization uh, can do is we are assessing our resources and our practice. What we are, are we good at, and what we and what we are bad at. What are our defects and what are our excellent uh, points? Accordingly, we will identify a gap analysis, okay, and see that we have these strength point and these weakness point, and we have these opportunities and threats from outside. Let's see how to deal with it. Let's see how to formulate the strategies to act on these challenges. And this will be a strategy formulation. And we have to implement this formulation and this strategy and to measure it and control it. And we will go into these steps one by one now. But if we want to apply the concept of exemplary leader on this, you will find that the first part is challenging the process. We are challenging the process. We are asking ourselves, we are posing questions on our status quo. And we are asking ourselves, where do we stand from outside environment? Where do we stand from competitors? Where do we stand from uh, MOH and other laws and regulations? So we are challenging the process at this step. 
after this, we are formulating strategies, and this strategies will be our vision, a shared vision. It's the goal that everyone in the organization has to work towards achieving it. So after this, we have, after having a strategy formulated, we have this enormous graph, Hoshin planning process. And the Hoshin planning process has a very important uh, point, which is deployment, the second rectangle. Deployment of our roll down to department. After we identify the strategies, then we will go for the department and tell them those are our goals. That what we want as an organization to achieve and reach within three to five years. Please do your work, identify your improvement opportunities. What are your operational plan that will take us into this space? Okay. Again, we will go through this one by one. So we are modeling the way we are going to understand, to clarify, to teach them, and we are enable those head of departments to act. We are, as leadership, have to give them resources, time, uh, talented employees, uh, all resources that they need in order to improve. So it's some way of implementing the exemplary leader on the level of strategic planning. Okay, so let's go back deeper into the strategic planning step by step. Okay. First, this is the pyramid of the strategic planning upside down. Okay. If we have a strategic plan, we have to start with that mission, vision, and then we identify a key issues and goals. And if you remember the, the first uh, slide, we stated at the goals as formulating goals, and this is the strategic plan. As you can see in the graph, the first three steps and including the objective is the strategic plan. And then we will go by Hoshin to the department in order to identify what the objectives, what are the processes that need to be improved, and what are the metrics and the measurement that we want to work on. And this is the departmental business plan. So this is the difference between the strategic plan and the business plan. The strategic plan is a high level, is developed by the leadership and top management, and then it will go down and to be uh, broke down into objectives, processes, and metrics. Okay, the strategic plan has to, as we said, we have to have a vision. It has to be uh, midterm, three to five years, and then an objective, which has to be annual. We have to, as I said, deploy and roll down, uh, implement control, daily control, and then to have uh, your progress measured on monthly and quarterly basis. Okay. Mission statement. We said that the mission and vision is the first. Mission statement is what the organization, who are we, okay? This is important. The mission statement should answer four questions. What do we do? Whom do we serve? How do we do it? And why do we do it, okay? What do we do? Let's define who are, what are the needs of our population? Let's say we are serving a, a children cancer hospital, for example. So we have to say that we are a children cancer hospital. And by saying that we are children cancer hospital, we identify what do we do and whom do we serve. So we are serving children. Okay, so we're not expecting to have to having adults. So this statement, if it is there on our, on our mission, so we are stating what do we do and whom do we serve? Okay, then how do we do it? Let's say that we are going to serve or, or we provide uh, uh, oncology services to pediatric population by committing with the current professional guidelines. So this is how, or by using the most uh, advanced technology or advanced technology or uh, the most skilled stuff. So this is how it might be all of them by providing the best stuff, the best technology and the best knowledge. Okay, so why do we do it? That's our mission. This is what we want to provide. Why do we do it for the, our, uh, our patients? Okay, here are some examples of the organizational uh, mission. 
The first one, the organization is pledged to strive for excellence and quality of services, competence in the professional support and volunteer staff, and the maintenance of modern, efficient, and technologically current equipment and facilities consistent with the needs of patient and community. It's long one, however, it states who do we serve, patient and community. So this is not only a treatment we are expecting from the scope of services that there are some preventive or educational or let's say uh, vaccination, something related to the community, not only to the patient. So he identified what kind of people or population he is dealing with, how by striving for excellence, by competent staff, by volunteer staff, by maintenance of modern efficient technology. So what services does he give? It is not clear. So this is missing, this statement missing, what do we do? The next one, through our exceptional healthcare service, we reveal the healing presence of God. This is more dramatic and it's more like a slogan or more than uh, a mission because it lacks the uh, who do we serve, uh, yes, we deliver healthcare services, exceptional, this is good. However, it is very uh, primitive, yani, uh, minor. The last one, we are dedicated to the well-being and the respectful, compassionate healing of our patient and our communities. Again, he is talking about healing. He is talking about uh, patients and communities. He is identifying a why, his why is well-being, okay? How? By respectful, compassionate healing. However, the scope is not very clear. Most probably it is very uh, why the scope might be a tertiary hospital or something. Okay, now, that's the, the vision, the, the, the mission. What is the vision? If the vision, is, if the mission states the current, okay? So the vision states the future, okay? The vision is a picture of what we want to reach. The mission is what we are doing right now. If you revise the question, what are we doing? Whom do we serve? How and why? And those, all of them in the current, or on the, the present sentence, what we are doing right now. But the vision is what we want to reach after a while. It might be three to five years. It will be at the end of the strategic plan. So the vision statement, here is example. Healthcare, for, uh, the, the last one, I will go for the last one for the type C. To be the member-centered system that most effectively integrates health promotions, care delivery, financial, and administrative services to improve the health of our members and our community. Here is what they are proud of, that what they want to read, to be the member-centered system, the most effectively integrate health promotion. That's what they want to reach. Okay, now, so we said we talked about the mission and the vision. There is a good statement: if the mission, if the vision is the destination, the mission is the vehicle. If we apply the mission every day, we will reach our vision. Then the core values and the values is what we believe. Uh, what can culture of the hospital or the organization? It might be respect, patient centeredness, competency, appropriateness. And here is some examples of the uh, core uh, values. So to brief, mission statement comes from the head because it represents represent the, the, the present, okay? We speak about today. It starts more than start now. However, vision comes from the heart. It is what we want to reach. It's our inspiration, okay? And it is answered a question of what do you want to, uh, to be in the future? It's more like a photographic vision, okay? So it speaks for tomorrow. The value is comes from the soul. It represents the culture and it speaks about constant behavior, beliefs, and sticks to your values. Okay, so those are the first thing that we need to do. Then after identifying the mission, vision, and the uh, values, we have to perform an external assessment and internal assessment. That's what I told you. We have to see what is there outside in our community. Define what are the benchmark, who are our competitors, and accordingly, how are we going to improve in, this, in such uh, environment? Okay. So we will check demographics, as I said, the gender, the language, the ethnicity, 
uh, do we have a certain type of disease that is going up and increasing lately or not? So we grab data about the external environment and then we assess our data. What are the utilization services? How do we utilize our capacity? Do we work full uh, capacity of our OR or we can improve? What are the quality measurement for our financial status and performance? So the internal assess assessment or analysis is our data. After we grab all these data from the external environment and internally, we will go for issue analysis. And issue analysis, we will check what the strength, weakness, opportunities, threats, okay? We can make it simple. Strength and weaknesses are internal. It comes from the internal assessment, okay? It's my own control. It's areas that I'm good at and areas that I'm not good at. So strength, what are we unique at? What the resources that we have? What experience, knowledge, location, price, accreditation? What makes this hospital special? And what it gives this hospital a competitive edge over other hospitals? Weaknesses, on the other hand, is that what we are not good at? What do we lack? Is it reputation? Is it resources as well? It might go the other way. Do we have an effect in some process? Do we have a high infection rate? Do we have a low utilization rate? Do we have a lower census? So we have to understand what is our internal strength and weaknesses. Then opportunities and threats. And opportunities and threats are from outside, from the external. What opportunities out there? Do we have like a, a, a vacant uh, landscape that we can acquire? and expand our place? Do we have a new insurance company coming up? Do we have the transformational or the, the, the 2030 vision, which will enable the private sector to be, to have contracts with the MOH because the MOH now is going only to be a regulator and they are not going to provide uh, healthcare services anymore. So this is an opportunity. What are the threats? Do we have a competitor that is coming up do we have a problem in the environment? Uh, corona, for example, this is a threat. Okay, political effects. All of these are threats, those from outside. So after we grab all the data, we are segregating this data into opportunities and threats and weaknesses and strengths. Then we will go for goals formulation. And for goals formulation, we go. We, we might use a matrix say named TOWS matrix, T-O-W-S, is the other way in or around of SWOT. So what do we do in TOWS? We put our strength and, and weaknesses up there, and on the left, we put our opportunities and threats. And then we are trying to think how to use our strength in order to benefit from an opportunity. How to maxi maxi. Maxi maxi is taking the most benefit of opportunity and the most benefit of how to maximize our strength and how to maximize our benefit from the opportunity. So the first, uh, the first cell here, SO, strength opportunities, is using external strength, internal strength, and to take advantage of external opportunities. It's maxi max. The next one is many maxi, how to overcome our weaknesses through an opportunity. If there is an opportunity for having a contract with a new training center and I lack training and one of the weaknesses that I identify through internal analysis is uh, that I lack training. So and now there is an opportunity to have a contract. So I will benefit from the opportunity to minimize my weakness. So it's many maxi. I minimize the weakness in order to uh, by maximizing the opportunity. ST is the other way around, maxi many. I'm maximizing my strengths to overcome a threat, to minimize a threat, okay? Let's say uh, we have uh, a good visual triage uh, and good negative pressure room because we had an experience with uh, uh, SARS earlier. 
And now we have a threat of Corona. When we had, when we 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 uh, we are at the time of Corona, we had a threat of Corona. Okay, so I will benefit from my design. This is a strength point. Other hospital might not have this strength point in order to overcome a threat. So this is my strategy. My strategy is how to use and how to improve my visual triage or uh, respiratory pathway in the ER in order to overcome this threat. And the last one is how to minimize many, many, minimize my weaknesses and minimize my uh, uh, threats. Okay, <clears throat> here is an example, the same, I think, but more uh, clear. Uh, as I said, here we will state S1, S2, S3, weak W1, W2, W3, O1, O2. And then we are trying to formulate ideas. And here we are just going to describe the idea on how to uh, work on these uh, threats and opportunities, etc. So it's a strategy formulation. After this exercise, we will be having out strategies. And here is example. Our strength is profitability, brand recognition, global presence. And our free opportunities is new market, new product, purchasing companies. So we are going to reinvest, reinvest profit into new market. We have profit S1 and we have opportunity O1, which is O1. So we are going to reinvest profit into new one. Use the brand to sell new products. We have new product and we are good brand. So we will use the both of them together. That's it. We are trying to find out strategies, how to are going to implement uh, and actions in order to get benefit from our assessment. <clears throat> After these goals or after these strategies, we have to identify what is our goal, okay? Our goal, the term goal is a broad statement, long-term outcome, okay? If you remember uh, the Hoshin, and before the Hoshin, we stopped at the strategy formulation. Uh, here, we stopped here. We identified the strategies and these strategies are some sort of goals. Okay, so our goal is to reinvest profit into new market. Our goal is to use its brand. Our goal is to uh, lower prices for the new product. So those are goals. These goals, we will take these goals and go for the department and ask the department, how are you going to implement these goals according to your scope of service? So each department will formulate a plan. And this plan has to be more specific than the goal. So the goal has to be broad, as you said, as you saw, but the objective has to be more specific. When we are writing the objective, we have to be short and simple. We have to focus on the outcome and it has to be smart, okay? And we will take, uh, see examples now. Then after we identified our uh, objective, we have to identify our metric. How are we going to measure? Uh, this objective. So we will ha be having for each goal a lot of objectives and for each objective we will have a measurement. And if we are following the measurement and we are, are following the progress of our uh, metrics, so we are following our objectives and if we manage to achieve our objective, we will be achieving our goals which are the core of and the output of the, our strategic plan, so we will reach our vision and we will have a successful strategy implementation. Okay, so here's the way of how to follow the uh, metrics. Okay, uh, the first column is the goal, not the first column yet, the second one. The first column is an initiative, improve efficiency and competitiveness. This is a, broad, a very broad one, how to work uh, this is like a, a, a title, okay? But the goal here is to reduce operational cost, improve revenue, implement the system, data management system, improve utilization of imaging services, improve utilization of OPD services. Those are goals. Those are broad goals. So we will go for these goals through the concerned departments, okay? As you can see that reducing operational cost the operation, the OR department said that the components for operation like consumables and medication package shall be identified on the hospital information system for 100% of the procedure. 
Okay, so they identified an objective. We have to identify for each operation, for each procedure, what are the required consumables, medications, uh, implantables, and to have it as a package identified on the system for 100% of the procedure. Okay, another one, increase the number of clean claims. This is from claim department by 50% to decrease rework time. Clean, the, 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 the term clean claim uh, is used for uh, a claim that will not come again. We don't have any comment on this claim or any missing uh, data. Okay, then we will measure our achievement. And as you can uh, see uh, that at quarter one, it was 20% of data uh, or, or of uh, items or procedures. Quarter two, we reached 43%. Quarter three, we reached 67%. Uh, Quarter four, 82, and etc. But to be fair, this objective is lacking the timeline. If you can check the next one, improve revenue, this is the goal. We have three objectives. Reduce rejection by 20% by the end of 2019. This is better objective. So we will measure the initial rejection rate, and it will be starting from uh, the June 2020. Okay, so at Q3 2019, it was 25%. So it has to be followed up, at, and we are expecting it has to be at Q4, 20%. So the rejection rate should reach 20% by Q4. So from this view, we can say, are we achieving our objective? Uh, outcome or not accordingly according to the metric are we achieving our goal or not okay we can present uh, our uh, strategic goals or objectives in two ways one of the most important way is balanced scorecard balanced scorecard is a way in order to balance the identification of the uh, the objectives into four perspectives usually they found they found the most corporates are concentrating on the, uh, the financial aspect, okay? And they are ignoring the other aspects. So the balanced scorecard is a way in order to have a balanced distribution of our objective into four pillars or four uh, perspectives, financial, customer, internal business processes, and learning and growth. And here is, I will go directly for an example. So when we are identifying our strategy or uh, our uh, objective, we have to be sure that we cover the four uh, pillars or the four uh, perspective. Financial profit margin, 2%. Okay. Uh, here is customer press gain overall at 15th uh, percentile. 85% uh, of hospice family members rated exceeded expectation. So he want to reach exceeded. This is from the customer satisfaction side. From the business readmission meets CMS standards. OR utilization average 18%, 100% of clinical departments trained. So those are business processes, how to improve our business. And the last one is learning and growth. Let's talk about the customer, the, our staff, how to improve this. 100% of managers and above trained in lean, 25% of physician and leaders complete leadership boot camp. So here, if we have these objectives in that way, so we are ensuring that we are not concentrating on one perspective or one pillar and ignoring the others. Okay, here is an example. Another example, strategic goal, develop a state of art program for breast care, uh, cancer detection and treatment. Okay, how to measure it? It might be a structure or process or outcome. We might measure the quantity of imaging equipment. We might measure the number of patients diagnosed with imaging technology. And we might measure the higher percentage of early diagnosis due to use of imaging technology. Okay, so here, now we finished the strategic uh, planning and we identified uh, how to set goals and objectives and how to measure it and how to follow it up. Now we are going to say how to engage the leadership into this process, how to reflect these uh, objectives into, into quality outcomes how to link the long-term strategies into the short term. So in order to, this, to do this, we have to identify our goals against benchmark. 
benchmark is what is the best practice and the best outcome in the market or in the competitor or in the similar condition. Let's say we are measuring the hand hygiene, okay, between floors, okay? So the best floor achieving the best result of hand hygiene is our internal benchmark. So let's say that third floor is 96% and the rest of floors are not exceeding 90%. So the third floor is our benchmark. He is our reference of the best outcome that can come from the same condition. If we are applying it on other hospitals, let's say that our mortality, our ICU mortality rate, okay, is 0.2%. So we will find out another organization that has the same capacity, that has almost the same admission and discharge criteria, the same scope of services, and we will find their mortality rate, and then we can compare our mortality rate against their mortality rate. If we find a place or an organization that is better than us, this will be the benchmark, okay? And if we identify a goal for an objective, an outcome, it should be beyond the benchmark, beyond the benchmark, better than the benchmark, okay? If we have an improvement activities, improvement project inside the hospital, the quality department has to be sure with the leadership through the quality committee that these improvement activities are aligned with the strategic goals. If we said, we are not going to go with a department that says that I want to uh, increase the capacity of my uh, department, let's say radiology department, I want to increase the capacity of my department, and this is a project, but the overall goal of the hospital is to decrease and minimize cost. And we are not into that uh, expansion anymore for now. So it is not aligned with the strategic goals. So this will not go, this will not be implemented. Okay. Monitoring the progress of performance against strategic goals, as I, I showed you in the, uh, the table of the uh, dashboard, communicate the goal and identify and engage key stakeholders. And key stakeholders are very important in order to implement the strategic plan. Okay. Who are the, uh, uh, how to engage the, the stakeholders, okay? We have to communicate our goals. After the formulation of the strategy and identifying the goals, we said that we go for the department. And here comes a very important role of healthcare quality professional. Healthcare quality professional has to identify who are the key persons and how to train them and how to inform them about the uh, strategic goals, okay? Who are the uh, stakeholders, key stakeholders, and how do, do we engage them? Governing board, and we will know who are governing board now. Yeah, come and try any, uh, after a while. Uh, the governing board is the highest organization or highest group of people that are managing this hospital or the hospital. In our occasion, the governing board is the corporate level, is MECO, okay? So the governing board should re receive a reports about quality, about the, the advancement of our achievement towards our objectives and goals, okay? Okay, what about the physician? The physician has to know the quality activities. He has to be engaged in the quality improvement activities, okay? The first line, has to understand the concepts of quality, what are our ob objectives, they have to be in the improvement teams, okay? We might involve patients and families because we need their feedback, we need their, in in their input, their preferences, and we have to identify champions. And the champion is somebody who is respected and he is involved in quality, okay? Somebody is like you. Any one of you that is working in his place and he's interested in quality and he's trying to be a CPHQ professional might not have the opportunity to work in the quality department. However, he can be involved in quality teams. He can be involved in quality improvement activities. So he is considered as quality uh, champions. Here, 
we are going to talk about who are the leaders or the leadership levels. We have four levels. The first one is the governance, as I told you, the governing body. The second was one is the chief executive, manager, officer, whatever. And the third is the hospital leadership. And the last is the department and service leader. Governance are a group in, of individuals, such as community board, board of trustees. It, they might be the owners or the minister of health, for example, if we are a governmental hospital. As I told you, those are the entity that assign the chief executive manager and they monitor their, his, their performance or his performance. Then the chief executive, who is might be a physician or administrative, he is selected by the governance and he is responsible for presenting the hospital legally uh, and officially. Uh, if we are um, a, a school or if we are a college, he will be the dean of the medical school. Then comes the leaders and the leaders are the chief medical, chief nursing, chief operating officers, Chief quality is there, so the chief quality is the one of the leadership. Okay, he might the human resources might be there, financial might be there. Okay, and the last level is the clinical departments and service leaders. Uh, head of medicine department, head of uh, surgical department, head of uh, pediatric department, radiology, pharmacy, etc. Okay. So we have to work with all of these in order to identify what do we want to achieve, okay? Uh, after identifying who are the stakeholders, we have to understand what are the activities that we are doing in healthcare profession, as a healthcare professional. The activities will be selection of hospital-wide performance measures, okay? The activities will be aggregation and data analysis, improvement in quality and patient safety, Defining central events and managing central event as a patient safety, identifying near misses. Those are the activities that, and another thing is risk management. Uh, so, quality measurement, quality improvement, quality uh, patient safety, central events, near misses, risk management. Those are the activities. The quality program is that the quality department, it has to be led by a qualified individual. Okay. And he is responsible for the implementation of the quality improvement uh, and patient safety plan and program. Okay. The quality program stuff helps the departments how to choose their measurement. Usually the quality, the CPHQ and the quality program stuff goes for the department to identify what do you want to measure? How are we going to be sure that your performance is good? What is your operation and business plan? How, how are we going to measure your objective? Okay. Then they provide coordination and integration of measurement activities. So after setting, after setting with head of department and identifying the, uh, the measurement, they have to report this measurement into the quality council. And we will come into the quality council later. This measurement or this suggested measurement has to be reported through the quality council. So the quality council will choose what to measure and how to integrate the data. Let's say that we set with the pharmacy and the pharmacy said that we want to measure the antibiotic stewardship proper. And the lab said we want to measure the antibiogram and the sensitivity of antibiotics. And the infection control said we want to test the prophylactic antibiotic ER. So three departments are want to work want to work on antibiotic stewardship program. Okay, if they are working solely, so a double work might occur. And here is the importance of the quality department. If we are integrating these data together, so you, we might facilitate measurement in different areas other than double work and measuring the same part by different departments. So the integration is important. And then we track the progress of plant collection. After we agreed on what we are going to collect or to measure, the quality department will help the uh, head of department to collect the data using a data collection sheet. And then we will track the progress. We will ask the department, please submit your data. 
and he will submit the data to the quality department. We will analyze the data, okay? And then we will compare the data with ourselves over time, month to month, okay? Or year to year. So we help the department to collect the data. The department send us the data. We analyze the data to compare month to month, to compare with similar organization, as I told you, as a benchmark, to compare with a standard or a target, are we there yet or not? And then we might compare it with a best practice or guidelines, okay? So this is the importance of data analysis. Uh, I will skip this part because the, there is a duplication. We talked about it uh, earlier. I will summi summarize the responsibilities of the, the levels that the leadership and the HODs, they create and develop the objective, they create and develop the measurement, they create and develop the policies and procedure, and then they raise this to the chief executive and the leadership level as well through the quality committee in order to prioritize and recommend our plans and our strategies to the governance. And the governance has to discuss, approve or disapprove or modify to finalize our strategic plan, our objectives, our quality improvement data. Uh, that's it. I finished the first part, which is the quality and uh, the leadership and management. Uh, we have five minutes for questions, uh, if you want. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Abdelgawad, for this uh, very informative session. So please, if you have a question, either you raise your hand or write the question in the Q&A box. So wait for three minutes. If you don't have questions, we'll go for 15 minutes break. I think we don't have questions here, Dr. Abdelgawad. So we'll go into 15 minutes break and we have here a question. Thank you, Mylene. So you. we'll go into 15 minutes break and we'll turn back inshallah at 11. Okay, see you.
So we'll just start in two minutes. Still, we have some participants who didn't join yet. And then we'll start in Charlotte. So thank you all for attending with us. In this session, inshallah, I will be presenting to you um, information management. So by the end of, of this session, we'll be able to identify key concepts in management of quality information, decision support, comparisons and benchmarking, evidence-based information practices, and statistical techniques and tools. So we'll start with what is data? What is the different between data and information. So data is uninterpreted facts and observations. And usually you find them stored in, in a defined format like paper, like computer, like microfilm. So for example, if we have uh, radiology images, this is data, but the report or the interpretation of what's in the radiology images is the information. So information is obtained when data are analyzed and translated into results and statements that are useful for decision making. And this is, this is called the knowledge cycle. It shows that data, when it's processed, uh, it becomes information. Then when we have the information, it will be translated into knowledge. Then knowledge will, be, will, will help management to take informed based decisions. Then of course, there will be improvement in patient outcomes. I'll give you an example here. So I think that most of you are familiar with the, um, with the OR logbook. So our logbook has many, many data points or data elements. It has patient name, medical record number, sex, age, uh, what is the surgery, the surgeon, uh, anesthesia, blood transfusion, if there are any anticipated uh, like, um, uh, complications or if there are actual complications and so on. So let's imagine that we have this huge OR logbook and when quality took this logbook, we were able to process the data and we got information that we have unplanned returns to OR, like high up to the sky above the benchmarks. So this is information we compared, we analyzed the data, we, we, we compared the data to the benchmarks, either internal or external, and we found that these data are up to the sky above the benchmarks. We have high rate of unplanned returns to OR. Then, when you get information on the information, so let's say that we got back into the high rate of unplanned return to OR, and we found out that these cases are most common in gastric sleeve surgeries. So now I have information on the information. So information is translated into knowledge. Now the management and the OR leadership know that we have a problem in gastric sleeve surgery, which will help them to make a decision either by adopting evidence-based practice, by by reviewing the credentials and privileges of these providers and so on, which of course will help us to improve patient care. So we have many sources of data. We have internal data and external data. So in internal data, we have the, the data that we have in our hospital, like, or we generate in our hospital, the, like the medical records, like the quality reports, infection control reports, um, patient surveys, interviews, um, blog books, and so on. And for external data, we have like reference database, um, third party payers or, uh, or insurance companies, accreditation reports, uh, validated clinical pathways and identified as best practices. 
So we have mainly these steps. You'll find these steps arranged in a logical flow for the information management process. So first, I have to identify what information do I need. So for example, I have to prioritize the data or the information that I need before I go into data collection. So let's say that we have priority or prioritization uh, uh, matrix that has, uh, we need to visit the high risk areas, the high volume areas, problem prone areas related to, to accreditation, uh, related to finance, related to any of these elements. So when I prioritize, then I'll go into defining the data elements. What do I need? If I have, uh, for example, I've selected um, unplanned returns to ER, um, antibiotic to, to sepsis in, in septic patients in ER. So I have to determine what is the numerator of this formula, what is the denominator, um, uh, who will collect the data, the frequency of data collection, when are we quality people who receive the data and so on. Then we will acquire the data, then we'll work on the aggregation and display, as I said, then we'll do our analysis, then we'll have to have um, like a venue to report this information. For example, if it's related to surgery, it will be in the OR committee. If it's related to, um, to patient satisfaction, it will be in the patient experience committee and so on. So after that, we'll act on information, then we will collect more data to assess the decision. So we have two types of data collection tools. We have quantitative data collection and qualitative data collection. Qualitative means the quality of, of it. Not, nothing is quantifiable. So uh, like, like when we have interviews with the patients, focus groups, observations, and so on. For quantitative methods, which is the data sheets, check sheets, surveys, and questionnaires. So for surveys, um, as you all know, we have here in Saudi German hospital, we're using, for example, um, uh, press gain survey for patient satisfaction. So, um, so in these surveys, of course, we, we, we try to measure patient satisfaction, get feedback from the patient. So, but before we do this, we have to know something. We have to know our audience, who are our audience. We have to keep it short and simple. Uh, so we have to ask direct questions. No one likes to, to be asked a vague question or a wrong question. Um, uh, and that's it. Then we'll receive the raw data, do the analysis and so on. For the focus groups, it's useful tools for, to determine customer opinions regarding large range of topics. Also, it has to be led by moderator. It's a key role to have a good moderator to moderate these focus groups. Ideally, it should consist of eight to 12 members who should be homogenous. For example, we can select male patients who had surgeries in our hospital and ask them about the practice that we had or, the, or their, their, their experience with us. Uh, we can select a group of, of women who had CS, um, uh, cesarean section with us in, in our hospital and so on. And um, members of course should have adequate experience in the youth services. And the meeting should be from one to three hours to discuss beliefs, feelings, attitudes, and regarding this issue. So we have three timings of data collection. We have prospective, which is prior to care being rendered. We have concurrent, which is during the care is being rendered, or retrospective after, after the care is, is rendered. So for prospective, I'll give you an example here. Um, 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 patient discharge planning. Discharge planning happens upon admission, as you all know. So if I have a proper discharge planning process, I'll be able to know before the patient discharge if, the, if this patient will need um, a wheelchair upon discharge, if this patient will need um, uh, nursing care at home or nursing home care at discharge. So I can facilitate this before the patient is being discharged. That's how I collected the data perspective. So for concurrent, as also most of the quality professionals, all the quality professionals know, uh, like the open medical record review, I review the performance or the compliance of documentation while the patient is still in our hospital, patient is still admitted in our hospital or care is being rendered. And the retrospective is after the care is being rendered, they're also like the closed medical record review. I review documentation or compliance with the quality of documentation after the patient is charged from the, our hospital. So, 
one very important topic in data is sampling. So of course, for example, here in Jeddah, we have more than 40 discharges per day. So if I need to collect data about discharges, I cannot take the 40 discharges. We are taking, we're talking about uh, 1,200 patients per month. I cannot collect the data, or I don't have the manpower to collect the data for 1,200 patients per month for one KPR, for example. So we have to know what are the sampling techniques, what are the sample size, to collect a representative sample, a sample that represents the entire population. So sampling is a process of selecting a representative part of the, of the population, as I said, of interest in order to submit the organization's performance. Um, as most of our KPIs, sampling should be undertaken on a monthly basis. Uh, sometimes we take it quarterly. Uh, in case of incidence measures, we have to take 100% of cases like um, for um, hospital acquired uh, pressure injuries, I cannot take a sample here. Uh, patient falls, I cannot take a sample here. I have to take the 100%. So this is like an example here um, of the sample size based on the uh, JCI library of measures. There are many, many guidelines or many, many instructions about how to take the sample, or how, or how big should be the sample. Here. But this is just an example. I'll let you know where to find another example. So here, if you are collecting a KPI for, from the library of measures, if you have the total population or the capital N above 59, the required sample size, which is the small N, will be 58. If it's the total population is less than 58, the sampling or will take 100% of the population. So for Sibelian, for example, they are requiring us to have 5% of total population sample. There is another, another um, uh, like instructions from JCI, which is the 30, 50, and 70 cases as relevant to the population example. So there are so many examples. There are even um, uh, websites uh, that can help you to select a proper sample size. So as I said, um, there is an entire population. I can, uh, when I decide to take total population or total population, I will gather 100% of the data, like all cases encountered, encountered or admitted for a particular diagnosis, all cases admitted for a given period of time for a specific genetic screen, all deaths, all cases with particular treatment or procedure performed. When it comes to sampling, we have two, two ways of sampling, but probability sampling and non-probability sampling or two categories. Under probability sampling, there is simple random, stratified uh, random, and systematic random. For the non-probability, there is convenient sampling and quota sampling. For the simple random, it, has, it says that everyone has an equal opportunity to be selected in the sample, which means that if I have 100 populations. If you can see here, any one of these can be selected. For systematic random sampling, I select based on n, selecting every end case. For example, I will put the, all the patients on one list and I will select the first case. Then I will say, I will select every third case from this. So it's called systematic random, like this. I have considered this is the whole population and I selected every third. So I selected this one, this one, this one, and so on. So there is another technique for sampling under probability sampling, which is stratified sampling. In this stratified sampling, I will have, if I have a big group of patients, let's say that I have 100 patients, in this 100 patients, I have 50 males and 50 females, and I need 10% from this sample. So what I will do, I will put the homogeneous groups in each strata. I will have a stratum for males that has 50 males, and I have a stratum for females that has 50 females. And I will select, randomly select five cases from the males strata, and five cases from the female sister. Now I have the sample set that I need, selected from homogeneous groups, as I said, and 50% males and 50% females, which is representing the total population. 
For the non probability sampling, we have something called convenient sampling, which is uh, like biased using data most readily available. I'll say that I'll go collect uh, data on all the cases in ED for this week, or I collect all data in um, emergency department who came from 3 to 5 p.m. So this is convenient. I know what I need from this data. So, and there is also quota. Quota means percentage of person cases in a stratified population, which is like 100% of male patients with diabetes and heart diseases over age 55. So I selected a specific percent from a specific strata, which is very specific. So let me summarize again the, the, the sampling methodology because it might be for non-quality professionals, might be a little bit um, uh, sophisticated. So I have two ways of sampling or two categories of sampling, which is probability or non-probability. Under probability, I have simple random, stratified num random, and systematic random. For simple random, every member or everyone in each, uh, in the entire population have an equal opportunity to be selected in this sample size. Stratified number, random, I will divide the entire population into stratums or strata, and I will select randomly from this strata. And usually strata should be uh, of homogeneous groups. So for example, um, uh, if I have uh, more than one ICU unit in the hospital, and I, but it's specialized ICU units, and I have medical ICU, neuro ICU, um, uh, surgical ICU, and I need representative samples from these three units. I will select from, as I will put all the patients from medical ICU in one strata, all patients from um, surgical ICU in one strata, and I select, I will put all patients from um, uh, neuro ICU in one strata. I will randomly select from these patients. A systematic sampling, which is every end. I will put the entire population in, let's say, in one table, on one list, and I will select the first. Then I will select, for example, every tenth, every fifth case, every third case, and so on. Then I have the non probability sampling, which is convenient sampling, which says that we we'll use the most data readily available, like, for example, here, all patients seen in, in emergency department in a given week or all patients seen uh, uh, from three to five and so on. One quota, which is also portion or percentage of person cases in a stratified population, like for example, 100% of male patients with diabetic and heart disease over age 55. Then we have two types of data. We have quantitative data and qualitative data. Quantitative, which is, as I said, can be quantified, expressed as numbers. While qualitative data is expressed as description, like for example here for qualitative sex, like male or female, cough, yes or no, hypertension, mild, moderate, severe. But for quantitative, it's expressed the numbers, age in years, children in number, pulse and beats per minute, and so on. We have two types of quantitative data, which is categorical or discrete data. This data can be counted and categorized, cannot be measured or broken down, and only as whole numbers, like number of procedures performed, members, patients, births, deaths, occurrence, and so on. While for continuous, it can be measured as well as counted and categorized, and can be measured both in whole and fractional units, or, or in can, can take on different values on a continuous scale, like weighing, patients, uh, patient weight, for example, patient blood pressure, patient height, uh, patient temperature, and so on. For the qualitative data, we have two categories, which is nominal, like had nominal, like name, male or female, or ordinary, something that put in order, like mild, moderate, severe. So we have here descriptive statistics. Without, as you know, without the statistics, we cannot understand the, the huge amount of data that we have. So descriptive statistics is used to summarize large amounts of data using a few meaningful numbers. 
So if you can see here, we have raw data, unorganized, that we cannot get anything from this data. So when I have data that looks like this, we have to start something called sorting. We have to sort our data. We have to have methods of ordering measurement data, to put them in order, enable, like to enable us to compare groups of data together. So there are many ways in, in data to put data in order, which is frequency distribution, relative frequency or percentage, and ratio. So here, when I put data in order, so if you can see, it's, it's a little bit clear now. I'll start to do the frequency distribution. Frequency distribution is the logical and systematic arrangement of numerical data in ranking order. I rank the data like this. Then it's usually a list order by quantity showing the number of times each value appears. For frequency distribution, we have simple frequency distribution, which is all possible values or range are listed in one column. And the number of times each numerical value appears in the set of data is listed in an adjacent column. I'll show you now an example here. Or grouped frequency, which we have the range of values might be white. So we have to group the values together in something called on blocks called class interval, and each containing an equal number of possible value, which is the width of the class interval, generally between 10 to 20. Then we have cumulative frequency. Cumulative frequency is calculated as the sum of the frequency of that value or point, plus the frequencies of all points or classes of similar value. I'll show you also now on, on like example. So here, this is the, an example of the manpower that we have um, in the hospital. So I have here IT, we have 42, ER doctors, 42, Ministry of Communication, 42, operators, 42, and so on. So this is the frequency. So what are the, the percentage of, of each according to the total number, which is the percentage frequency? I have here 14.5 for IT, 14.5 for Ministry of Communication, operator, and so on. And this one should be 100%. The total of this should be 100%. Then I have cumulative frequency, which is the frequency plus the previous one. I, I have like an addition of the frequency when I sort this data this way, plus adding the number before. For example, here in, uh, in the ER doctors, the cumulative frequency is 14.53 plus 14.53, which is 29.1. And this one, in the Ministry of, of Communication, the cumulative frequency is, will be the percentage frequency here plus the cumulative frequency before, and so on, till I reach 100%. This is also an example of group frequency. Here I have the class. I have class of patients under five years, five to 10 years, 10 to 15 years, and so on. And you have the frequency of them. How many do I have here? And what percentage do they present from the total population? <clears throat> so one of the tools that we usually use to present frequency is the bar chart. You can see here, the bar chart is used for display of comparisons between different groups or collection of discrete objects or events that cannot be ordered. And it compares two or more categorical variables each bar represents a category, which is different from the histogram. Histogram is continuous. So a histogram is a bar graph of the frequency in one other variable. Because as I said, the frequency is actually a continuous variable. That's why the bars are blended. You can see here, we have to blend the bars. We have to organize them with this frequency and we have to blend them. So the data or the bars are no longer discrete. So the, the histogram is the most commonly used frequency distribution tool. As I said, does this by presenting the measurement scale of values along its axis scale. Each bar is equal to size interval and the frequency scale um, along the y-axis. It's a very important distinction must be made here regarding bar charts and histograms. 
with the bar chart, the x-axis consists of discrete categories, as I said before, while um, in the histogram, it's continuous categories. Also, there is, I think that most of you have heard about this um, Pareto principle, which is the law of 80-20 uh, rule, which, is which says that, uh, that we have like the causes or the 80% of the effects come from 20% of the causes. And I'll show you now how we do, do we do it. <clears throat> or in other words, it's called vital few and useful many. Here's the same table that, that we showed in the, in, the, in the previous example. For example, here I have here the cumulative percentage or frequency on the right side. Here I have the incidence or the number of medication errors or the frequency of medication errors. So when I take a horizontal line here at the cumulative frequency, I will and go into the X axis, I will find that wrong time medication administration and wrong dose is responsible or are responsible for 80% of the medication errors that occur in our facility. So there is also one very important topic, which is the measure of central tendency or averaging. We use three things here. We use something called mean, something so called median, or something called mode. I'll go in details into each one of them. So in general, the mean is the sum of the list divided by the number of the items on the list. So often referred to simply as the average, as I said. So um, I'll give you an example. If I have like set of data, which I presented by X, and I have uh, values of this data, like X1, X2, X whatever, till whatever, infinity, so to calculate the mean from set of values, I have to like add all these values together and divide them by the total number of values. So here I have one, two, three, four, five values. So I have six, three, eight, five, and three. And these are five values, right? So I will add six plus three plus eight plus five plus three divided by five then I will get the average. Averaging is very easy, I think, and very understood to, to each one of you. Then we'll have the mode. The mode is the number that occurs most frequently. When we have the data, then we sort the data. It will be the number in the middle that it's occurring more frequently, the midpoint of the data. So the median is different. And actually median is one of the most accurate uh, between all of them. Whenever we have, uh, if we have a normal distribution, mean will be very accurate. If we have a skewed distribution, median will be very accurate. So whenever you're doing um, um, averaging to any skewed data, you have to use the median, not the mean. There's a comparison here between the types of, of central tendency or types of averages. In, in, and as I said, in unimodal symmetrical distribution or the normal distribution curve, the values of mean, modium, mood, and median are almost the same. But in asymmetrical or skewed distribution, the mode falls at the highest point, the mean falls someplace towards the tail, and the median lies between the mode and the mean. That's why I'm saying whenever we're, we're ha having asymmetrical or skewed distribution, we have to use the median. So there is a comparison between um, a mean and the median. Here we have the set of data. In this set of data, the lowest is eight and the highest is 20. We have the mean here is 13.8 and the median is 14. So this is actually a little bit of normal distribution curve. So this one is skewed. We have the lowest is eight and the highest is 95. So you see here the difference between the mean and the median. The mean went up into 24.5, but the median stays the same at 14. We have here also skewed data from one to 20. The mean is 12.8 and the median is 14. So if you can see here, the median is very stable in the three in the three different uh, types or three different distributions. 
So symmetrical distribution, we use the mean. Asymmetrical distribution, it's better to use the median. It shows here, if you see here, we have the, the symmetrical or bell-shaped curve. In this bell-shaped curve, we have uh, the mode, the median, the mean almost at the same level. But in the skewed curve here, we have here the mean, we have the median in the middle, and we have the mode at the end of the curve. So measure of dis dispersion, or in another question, is it sufficient or is averaging will indicate any dispersion or indicate what are the, the proper dispersion in the, in the curve? The answer is no. So the central ten tendency measures can't alone describe the data. If you can see here, we have different curves, we have different distributions, but we have the same mean or the same mean. So why are these two distributions are different? Because they are different because they have different measure of dispersion or spread. See the distribution line here? Huge difference. You can measure dispersion by range, which is the difference between the maximum and minimum values in the data set. It's easy to calculate, but it's not sensitive. Or by variance, which is the measure of how far a set of numbers is spread out, um, uh, describing how far the numbers lie from the mean, which we measure it by standard deviation. It's the square root of the variance, and which is a very sensitive index for variation. I'll show you how. Here's the, the central tendency, mean, median, or mode. And we have, we have here the six sigma from negative three to three. And we have most of the data, 68.2 of the data lies between sigma one levels and 95.4 of the data lies between two sigma levels and 99.7 lies between three sigma levels. So for quality measurement, I think that also most of you are familiar with, uh, with the measurement and KPIs, but let me introduce you to something, to someone called Avidis Dunabidian. Avidis is one of the quality gurus uh, uh, in this field. And he said it has a very, very uh, good um, trilogy, which is called structure leads to process and process leads to outcome. So these are the three domains or the three areas that we try to, to measure in. We, have, we either have structured KPIs, process KPIs, or outcome KPIs. These are some examples of the, of the structured KPIs, process KPIs, or outcome KPIs. For structure, for example, we have manpower, um, finance, uh, uh, material, and so on. For process, we have um, central line insertion process. Uh, uh, how do we implement uh, full precautions? For outcome KPIs, it's like patient death patient satisfaction, uh, patient falls, uh, uh, pressure injuries, and so on. So why do you measure? Of course, we measure because you, we cannot manage what we don't measure. You know, this is one of the golden rules that we have in management and in quality. So as I said, measurement tools are either indicators, surveys, reviews, expert opinion, but at this point will be qualitative, not quantitative like the other three. So what are KPIs? KPIs are points of reference for evaluating the organizational or the organization's actual performance and comparing it with a targeted object or standard, objective or standard. So whenever we have KPIs, we put either uh, an internal target, which is internal benchmark, we, we might compare other uh, internal departments together, or we look into an evidence-based external benchmark from another organization, from, from the best practice from another organization. So as I said before, in the processes of information management, we have to identify what do we need to measure. Then by prioritization, of course, we have to identify the high-risk areas or high-risk uh, processes, um, uh, the high-volume ones, the problem prones. Um, whatever, anything related to regulatory, anything related to, um, to accreditation, 
then we have to describe and properly define these measures with numerator, denominator, um, uh, who will collect the data, when, uh, who will analyze and so on. So that's how we'll describe the data. We'll, we'll look into uh, an evidence-based um, uh, equation or formula or definition with benchmarks. Then we'll start designing something called um, data collection sheets. So I have here Mahmoud Tarak, raise his hand, please. Um, I, will, I will reply at the Q&A part, five, five minutes uh, at the end of the presentation. <clears throat> Let me, maybe my voice is away. Can you hear me clearly? May you please raise your hands if you can hear me clearly? Okay, thank you. The questions will be five minutes before, by the end of, the, of, the, of this session, inshallah. But then we will design the data collection sheets and, and we will train staff on how to collect the data. Then these staff will submit the data to quality department for analysis. Then we will analyze, and we will present the analysis to um, to the to the at, the at the correct venue, where it's quality patient safety committee or to the management. Then we'll take decisions, and we will implement decisions. So who select? Yes. So who will select at best the, the, the end user or the subject matter expert, which is the department head or the, or the physicians on the ground might suggest the KPIs. We will facilitate quality management, will facilitate the, the, as I said, the, the definition, the data collection and so on. And top management will prioritize. Of course, indicators should be smart, which is specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-bound. So as I discussed, how do we select or how to select KPIs? Uh, we have to identify important organizational function, like in clinical areas, high volume, high risk, low volume, high risk, problem prone. In service delivery areas, also we can have these, these the same prioritization criteria. Um, um, the second point is to identify the scope of care or service with each function. Then the third point is to identify what process that have a significant impact on patient outcome. Then when we collect the data, we can collect the data or display the data in either count, ratio, count like number of surgeries, number of, of, of patients came to this, uh, to this specific service, and so on. Ratio is part of the whole, or comparing two, two numbers together, like uh, cross-matching to transfusion uh, KPI. I think that we are all collecting this to monitor the blood ordering practices. So as I said, count is counting the number of people with a specific health event, like number of patients cannula side with, with cannula side infections. The ratio is expression, which compares or quantifies relative to each other. The most common examples involve two quantities represented by separating each quantity. As I said, cross-match to transfusion uh, blood units or cross-match to transfused blood units. Or we can display it as a proportion, which is a type of ratio which is in which the events included in the numerator must also be included in the denominator, like the patients with SSI surgical site infections, which is the numerator, divided by the number of surgeries conducted, which I have them also in the denominator. This is a proportion. The rate is part of the proportion also, special form of proportion, but it includes specification, which is time and population. This is an example here, number of events in a specified period of time, divided by population at risk of the specific event in a specified period of time, multiplied by 100.
So this is many of my colleagues that I see at, at the data collection phase when we receive the data, that we found that the only thing that is going high is our blood pressure, unfortunately. So how do we set targets? As we said, either we have internal targets, internal benchmarks, or external benchmarks. So if you can see here, the percentage of completed initial nursing assessment in first shift after admission, this is an internal target. We put the goal of 100%. Um, uh, delayed deliveries of routinely medical imaging reports within 48 hours, 30%. So how do I identify benchmark? Benchmarking in general, as I said, it's a method of comparing a particular process and its outcome in one organization with another. Usually, Usually we are looking for, not usually, always, we are looking for the best practice. So, um, so we are using benchmarking is used to define standards of excellence and best practice competences based on various criteria. So as I said, here we have an example on the internal benchmarking, uh, for example, cesarean section rate. We can compare physician A with physician B with physician C. And we see who has the, the, the least CS rate. This might be the benchmark. Um, we can internally um, uh, compare time to antibiotics for sepsis patients, for example, between emergency department and ICU, any other um, urgent care setting. For external, we can use central line associated bloodstream infection rates. We can compare our unit or, or our hospital with uh, national or CDC or national nosocomial infection surveillance data for similar units, or we can compare it. Now we're doing it with, we're doing some, some benchmarking with something called NDNQI. So we can, co we can correlate with, with similar organizations. So, and there are some zero incidence rate, like the, the, the wrong site infections, wrong procedure infection, wrong person surgery and so on. So as I said before, how to create KPI, this is like um, a sample of the, of the indicator card. So here we have identified the nursing department, the responsibility, which is the nursing department. What is the measure? Proper patient identification prior to medication administration. What is the target? Target is 100%. I have the numerator here, which is number of observations for pro of proper patient identification prior to administering medications and denominator, which is number of patients included in the sample. And the rationale why I'm collecting this KPI to monitoring patient identification process prior to medication administration, thus improving patient safety. Course. We also have another example, but with inclusion and exclusion criteria. I hear troponin um, turnaround time within 60 minutes from emergency department. We have set the target. We've set the numerator, the denominator, the data source, which is laboratory information system. Uh, method of monitoring would be retrospective through uh, laboratory information system, start time, identified, end time, uh, inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, and the rationale. So this is an example of how do we display the. Here we have the performance over the time with the target and the benchmark. So is it enough? Can you fatten the cow by weighing it? Um, the answer is no, we cannot. We have to apply more analysis techniques on, on what we're displaying. Like the most commonly used chart for, for analysis is the run chart that we use in hospital. So the line graph is um, spotted, as I said, performance over time. The data top, of course, it will be kept in order uh, and we can see the flow of the data like this one. And it helps us to answer so many questions. How much variation do we have? Is process changing significantly over time? Has our change resulted in improvement? Did I hold the improvement? So here at some points, data speaks for itself. Here we applied, if you can see here, the hospital has applied change in the medication reconciliation compliance. And when that change was applied, the data went up into the target. So there was a marked improvement since the change was implemented, the change was implemented. Also here, the data speaks for itself. 
we have here the unplanned returns to OR. For example, here, we applied pre procedural briefing, prophylactic antibiotics timing was identified. We have changed razors to clippers. We have um, adopted VTE prophylaxis protocol and so on. And see here, each intervention was coming with decline in the unneeded uh, uh, events. But sometimes it doesn't. If you can see here, the data is, doesn't display anything. And here comes the, the, the importance of central tendency, if you remember, the mean, median mode. So for this, we have to apply, as we said, the median. You can see here, we have variation in the, in the, or in the data, or we have screwed data. So when we apply the median, we can apply some certain rules over the median or over the run show. We have rule number one, which is the shift. The shift means that we have six data points above or below the media. This means that we have something here. When we have six consecutive data points above the mean or below the mean, it's called a shift, and it needs further analysis from the quality professionals. Rule number two is the trend. The trend happens when we have five or more consecutive data points increasing or decreasing. So increasing here might be indicating to that we have something good happens in the process and decreasing might indicate that we have something bad happening in the process. So both areas we have to interfere to see what happens in this process might be that the data collectors might be collecting wrong data or, or didn't have proper um, understanding of what they are collecting. Uh, uh, and also here, they might have a problem in the data collection, but here we might have, we might get like, good improvement idea from the people working on the ground that they have implemented. And here also we can see defects in the, in the process itself. So the rule number three is the an, an astronomical data point. It indicates that it's something uh, uh, not inherent with the process is happening. Something uh, that needs, of course, to be revisited. So whenever we have this astronomical data point, it has to be broken down or drilled down into what's happening. So which is bring us to variation. So variation, um, uh, there is the, 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 the father of, of, this, of this control chart is called Walter Stewart. Um, in the early uh, 1920s, he invented this uh, uh, control chart. You can see here, we have upper control limits. We have lower control limit. We have the mean at the middle. And we have data spread over the, within the upper control limit and the lower control limit and the, the mean. So we have two types of variations here. We have common cause variation, which is inherent to the process. I will show it to you in, in a graph to be more understood from your side. So we have common cause variation and special cause variation. Common cause variation is inherent within the process, or it might be due to regular, natural, or, or ordinary causes which results in a stable process that is predictable. While a special cause is something irregular happening, um, affects some, but not necessarily all aspects of the process and results in an unstable process. So common cause is if inherent design or inherent causes within the process. It might mean at some time that you have a stable process, but special cause, it means that something irregular is happening. So as I said, the, 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 the statistical process control or the control chart was developed in the 1920s at Bell Telephone Laboratories by Walter Sheward um, to aid in the production of telephone components that were at, of uniform quality. Um, as I also said, based on theory of variation, we have to know what type of variation do we have. Um, uh, and it has long history of use within the manufacturing and it's gaining popularity, of course, in healthcare settings. And the Joint Commission uses statistical process control to analyze hospital performances. So in control charts, it allows us to determine systems control 
like wide fluctuations, out of control systems. Out of control indicates opportunity to improve the performance here. And also it distinguishes or uh, differentiates between the common cause and special cause. So what we have here in this, if you can see my cursor, in this graph, this is common cause variation. See, there is like a noise in the process, but yet the process is still stable. But here we have points outside of the control limits. We have this point outside of the control limit, this point outside, this point outside, this point outside. It might indicate that we have either best practice or, or um, like very, very variation or very big variation in performance, bad variation that we don't know. In both cases, you have to investigate. So as I said, the elements of control charts is the average mean or median and the upper control limit and the lower control limit. So to apply control charts, we have to have at least from 15 to 20 data points. If you have less than 15 to 20 data points, means that control, your control chart will not be that accurate and you'll not get the information that you need from it. So also here, it's according to the sigma levels that we discussed in the frequency distributions. So we have the upper control chart, which is above three sigma level, either positive or negative. And the lower control chart is the same. So the criteria, as I said, for the special cause variation is, which is one value outside control limits, um, uh, two of three consecutive values above or below mean and greater than two standard deviation away from the mean. So if it's, two points above here or two points below here means that we have a special cause. Or if we have eight values above or below the means, which is called hugging the mean, or six values in a row steadily increasing or decreasing. So four or five consecutive points, more than one standard deviation from the mean on the same side of the central line. If these rules applies, the chance that changes seen are due to circumstances beyond regular variation. It's 99%. The circumstances above regular variation will be 99.7% in this case. If you can see here, I don't know if it's readable to you or not. Here we have a single point outside the control limit, upper control limit, and single point outside the lower, the lower control limit. And here we have a run of eight or more points in a row above and below the central line. Number three, we have six consecutive points increasing, you can see here, or decreasing. Here it's decreasing and here it's increasing. And in this drawing, we have two out of three consecutive points near a control limit, like this. And the fifth chart, we have 15 consecutive points around or close to the center line. So our last part of, of this presentation is the test of statistical significance. Significance tests are categorized into two main categories, either parametric tests or non-parametric tests. For parametric, Parametric is used to, uh, to differentiate or to measure on a continuous scale, while non-parametric is used with categorical data and should also be used with ordinal data, especially if the ordinal categories have small range. So parametric is used with continuous data or continuous scale, which is also known as variable data. Non-parametric is used for categorical data. For the parametric testing, we have something called t-test. T-test is used to analyze two difference or the difference between two means to determine whether the difference between two groups or two group means is significant. So it, it finds the difference or the significance in the difference between two means. So there are two groups, there are two, two kinds of t-test. There is a control uh, uh, independent or, or independent t-test and dependent t-test. 
So the two groups may be independent, which means that I have a control group and an experimental group. So, or they can be dependent where I have single group yields, pre-treatment and post-treatment scores. I'll give you an example here. So on a t-test, on a two sample independent t-tests, I have 10 out of 20 people are randomly assigned to experimental group and receive education on quality tools. And I have the remaining 10 will be the control group. They are not gonna receive any education on this. Then after that, attitudes towards using tools will be evaluated. For the paired sample, or the dependent test, we will train all 20, will give pre and post tests, and we will compare the results. Also, as part of the, of the parametric testing, we have the regression analysis. Um, the regression analysis or the correlation or the scatter diagrams is used to um, uh, find the statistical correlation between two variables, which means uh, we measure this by something called correlation coefficient, which is correlation coefficient might be from one to negative one. So if I have correlation coefficient, with, which is R, is one means that I have positive correlation. If it's zero, then it means that I don't have correlation between these two variables. If it's negative one, it means that I have negative correlation. But of course, these numbers you will never find. You'll never find R equal one or R equal negative one. So it's unfortunately, this is never the case as there are never perfect correlations, as I said. So it's never be like, it's never possible to make perfect predictions. Um, so let me give you a, like an example here. So let's give you an example. If I have um, here uh, staff with long shifts, we have here group of staff with long shifts and here number of errors during this time. So if I have positive correlation, which means that the, the trend is going this way, means that the more I have staff with long shifts working, I will have more medication errors or errors. But, so this is positive correlation. The trend is going up here, like comparing between two, two groups and with positive correlation. Here means, if you can see the data points are sporadic, means that I don't have correlation. When the line is going down, means that I have negative correlation. I'll give you also an example. Uh, when I have, um, um, uh, staff with experience in one shift compared to staff without experience, we'll see that staff with experience are compared with number of medication errors, the same as, as the one before. So I will find that when I have number of staff with more experience or more credentials, the number of medication errors will be declining. So I have positive correlation. I have the correlation coefficient is the one that I measure the correlation between two variables with. It will be ranges from one, to negative one. From zero to one means that I have positive correlation. From zero to negative one means that I have negative correlation. So the, the last part is the non-parametric test, which is the chi-square. If you remember, we said that chi-squares would be used for categorical data. So um, I'll give you examples here. So, so let's say that being counted, we have 15 males and 30 females patients in the clinic today means that many arithmetic operations don't apply. Like it's not possible to calculate the average gender of patients, but it's certainly possible to describe the ratio of the counts or to compare proportion with counted data. For example, I have 50% of males versus 75% versus of females came for their appointment today. Then I would be uh, uh, calculating something called reference rate which is this percentage, 0.5, divided by this percentage, 0.52. So I'll have two is the different rate here, which means men are twice as likely not to show up as women for their appointments. The good news is that this part is not uh, going to use it um, uh, too much in your practice. So it's just for the exam. If you are using the exam, you'll find one to two questions maximum in the t-test and chi-square. But in the practical life of quality, 
you're not going to use um, uh, uh, bias query t test unless you're doing uh, uh, researches. Because it's not that easy to, to most of the people. So concepts related to the tests of significance, we have something called confidence interval. We need to know, provides a range of possible values around the sample estimate, mean proportion uh, or ratio that is calculated from data. So confidence intervals are usually used when comparing groups, but they also have other applications, like they reflect the uncertainty that is always present when working with samples of subjects. The sample estimates are always the best Guess about the true value of interest. I'll give you an example here. Continuing to the missed appointment example that we, that we, that we discussed a few minutes ago, that 50% of men miss their appointments, but the true value may be higher or lower. There is similar uncertainty about the true proportion of women who miss their appointments and about the ratio of the men and women's proportion. Using the measure of variation from a sample, it's possible to construct confidence of interval which stated that the level of probability holds the true, the true value of interest. For example, it, observed, it was observed hypothetically that men are twice as likely to miss their appointments as women. So the 95% confidence on turf around the reference rate of two is from 0.27 to 3.13, meaning that there is 95% certainty that men are between 0.27 and 3.13 times more likely to miss. So it gives us a value here, like a range. Also a lower level of significance. The higher, the better, of course. A lower level of significance, which is 90% confidence interval around the reference rate for the appointment data would be from 1.47 to 2.77, which means that men are from 1.4 to 2.7 more likely to miss their appointment than women. So the level of significance, which is the p-value, gives us the probability of observing a difference as large as the one found in a study when, in fact, there is no true difference between the groups, when null hypothesis is true. So a small p-value indicates a small chance that the null hypothesis is true and favors the alternative hypothesis that there is a significance between the two groups. So let me, let me go to the example because the theoretical part is might be boring for you. So here the p-value of the ratio of missed appointment rates above was 0.02. So it was concluded that there was a little evidence that men and women had the same rate of missed appointments and determined that men probably had a higher rate of missed appointments. So how much higher? There is 95%, as we mentioned before confidence that the true value lies between 0.27 and 3.13, more likely to miss their appointments than one. And that's it. Thank you so much. Any questions? So I think I took five minutes more, Dr. Abdelgawad, but uh, I'll wait for two minutes for questions. If they, um, if I don't have questions, I will, I will uh, go into. We will go into fifteen minutes break. So I have a question here from engineer Hans saying that is setting the benchmark for each KPI is the responsibility 
of the quality department or the responsibility of the department concerned with this KPI. Let's say it's a shared responsibility. Whenever we have, at the end, the literature is, is there and it's for free. Whenever we're having a new KPIs, we do our own research as quality professionals, and we look into benchmarks. We, need, we look into valid, valid uh, formulas first, evidence-based, and we look into benchmarks. And the experts should do these benchmarks, should know these benchmarks. So, uh, for example, I have here um, a very good example for the head of, of Obigaini. Whenever I go to him with a suggested KPI, I will find the benchmark. He will send me the link to the to the to the literature he came from with the he came from with the benchmark and so on. But there are some people. This is not easy for them. So at this point, we have to be the facilitators and we have to look and get their approval on the benchmark. So we'll go into a longer break. I'll get back in 20 minutes. We'll start back at 12.30. This will be OK, Dr. Muhammad, for the schedule. Dr. Muhammad. Yes, Dr. Ahmed, we can manage, no problem. Or we should finish at, uh, we should get back at 12.15. Please let me know, 12.15 or? Make it 12.30. 12.30, OK. okay. Also, we'll get back. Please stay with us. Don't, don't log out. We will start again at 12.30 with Dr. Muhammad Abdelgaw. Thank you, guys.
good afternoon, everyone. I uh, hope you had a, a nice break uh, because you will need it. Uh, we, I want you to take a deep breath uh, because we are going to go to dive into performance and improvement, process improvement, and I don't promise that it will be easy, uh, but I hope it will be uh, interesting. Uh, now we covered two chapters from the CPHQ Convenient Outline, and here is the third and the most extensive uh, part, uh, and the most scored part in the CPHQ. It has uh, 40 uh, questions or 40 uh, points in the CPHQ. Uh, we will talk after this uh, part, you will understand how to describe performance and perform process improvement, including quality improvement opportunities, how to identify methods to establish priorities, how to prioritize, how to develop an action plan, how to evaluate success of improvement project. We will describe the team rules, the responsibility and scope. We will determine when and how to use teams for quality problems and improvement. And we will describe how to evaluate the team effectiveness. We will describe how to implement performance improvement method methods, such as Lean, PDSA, Six Sigma, including the uh, quality improvement tools. And we will describe how you pro improve, uh, uh, how you document your process improvement results. We will also have other um, separate or standalone subjects that is related to uh, performance improvement, but it is not related to projects or improvement process uh, process projects. Okay. Right. What is quality improvement? Why do we need quality improvement? Is it a department or is it fixing errors or is it trying to do things in a better way? Uh, actually, it, there, there is a history in this. The process started with quality control first. And the quality control was uh, only observation of the technique of the end result. We have like a checklist. Uh, this presentation has to. Uh, Yes, we have like a checklist to ensure that the end product is fulfilling the requirement, like this happy guy uh, testing the, the tools. Uh, and then there was another concept, which is why don't we work on the process itself and try to eliminate the errors and to improve it, okay? So we are trying to fix a bug in the production, and that was the definition of the quality assurance. Somebody is checking the problems and trying to eliminate the problems or the uh, effects. And then the concept and the philosophy of improvement came because in assurance, we had a threshold or problems or tasks that is not properly done. We are improving it and that's it. However, in quality improvement, we are always taking actions because we want always to get into a better quality a different level of performance. And this is the difference between quality assurance and quality improvement. So the error came into the quality improvement and then uh, we tried to find ways to improve for continuous improvement and for continuous seeking of different or higher level of performance. As you can see here, this graph has been developed by Joran. Uh, Joran, one of the gurus in the quality, and he has been named as the father of, of, of quality. He started in uh, industry, in, uh, in actually uh, Toyota, uh, and then he developed some concepts. From these concepts, we can see uh, that he identified that we have three main activities in quality. You will find it as quality planning here, up there. Here, quality planning quality control, okay, and quality improvement. So quality planning, quality control, and quality improvement. Quality planning, we are designing the process. We don't have a process, and we are designing it, and we are not in this phase. Quality control has been discussed through Dr. Ahmed in the last presentation. How are we going to measure our performance? How to know uh, our performance? How, how to plot it into the relevant uh, graphical representation to analyze it and to monitor our performance from month to month, as you can see in this graph. And then comes the improvement. When we find an opportunity, when we find a gap, when we find waste, like chronic waste here, 
okay? We have to work on improvement. We have to work on lessening this waste. And when we start improvement, we try to do two things, as you can see in this graph. The first thing is we are trying to minimize the waste, okay? If we have this area defined as waste, okay? So our area for waste here is has been minimized by much due to the improvement activity. The second thing that we are trying to minimize the variation between the process. If you can see here, each step is very variant from the previous one. We have a sporadic spike that was unjustified. So this process is not reliable. We cannot depend on the results of this process. If this process represents the average turnaround time from the lab, and you ask me at this point, at the point of control, okay, what is the average turnaround time? I cannot tell you because the process is not stable. The process is very variable. So working on improvement, we tend to do two things. We are trying to improve waste to minimize waste or errors and we are trying to standardize the process okay where ideas come from where do we find improvement how do you find it does it comes from the sky okay no actually there are sources to identify improvement activities do you remember strategic planning it's not very long time at the beginning, the first hour, okay? We talked about developing a strategies and the strategies comes out with uh, goals and the goals has to be deployed to the, or rolled down to the head of department in order to have a departmental plan in a PDSA cycle and an improvement. Because if we said that we want to go for a goal, it either a new process that it is not there or and a process that is there and we want to improve it. If you remember, we talked about the utilization of OR. If we have a goal to improve our utilization of OR, this is an improvement project. So we will work on studying what are the causes of this issue and trying to improve it. So one of the main ideas or the sources of improvement activities is the strategic goals and objectives. Okay, what else? Do you remember this again? It has been presented in Dr. Ahmed's uh, presentation about the key performance indicator. If we have a gap in the key performance indicator, if we are away from the target or away from the benchmark, then we have area for improvement. This is an indication to go and trying to improve your performance. What else if you have a patient safety event? This is in brief, a patient has came to ER complaining uh, from eruptions around her right eye, and then the nurse left her on the stretcher and get outside of the room to bring a blanket. And she came back with the, to find the patient on the room and the blood all over her face. This is a patient safety event, a significant event that might highlight gaps that needs improvement. So again, patient safety events might be an, a source of improvement. The risk management program last, uh, last Saturday, Dr. Hera, Dr. Yasmin, Dr. Shaheen gave us a brilliant presentation about risk management, and we identified how to manage risk. One of the areas that might come out with an ideas for improvement is the risk management. Okay. Uh, implementation of VAP bundle for all ventilated patients in ICU within one month is an improvement project. So risk management is uh, an opportunity. So we come with all these opportunities, all these measurement, so what do we do as a quality professional, as a healthcare quality professional? We have to establish criteria to prioritize what to do first, okay? We have to use data from the past to determine the gaps and again, benchmark and new regulations and uh, standards has to be there in order to identify where to go, okay? And then to involve the key stakeholders for input. Now we identified areas for improvement from different sources, from departments, from data, from strategic planning. We have to prioritize this, what to work on first. We have to set a prioritization rules. We will go for the core clinical processes, for high risk processes, for high risk medication, for high volume. So identifying 
criteria in order to privatize is the first step. Then we will go for a tool named privatization metrics. In prioritization metrics, we will put all uh, opportunities like infection rate, surgical complication, uh, emergency department time to treatment, falls with injury, medication safety. Then we will set the criteria that we are going to evaluate each opportunity against the criteria. So we have the high risk, high volume, problem prone, cost, customer satisfaction, regulatory, it might have a relationship with the re regulatory, um, authorities, then we will go for each opportunity and we will score the opportunity in the relationship with the criteria. If we're talking about infection rate, okay, what is the relationship between infection rate being high risk and taken to consideration that when we are putting a score, we are weighing this opportunity against other opportunity. So is it of higher risk than surgical complication, emergency department to treatment, falls with injuries, medication safety. The highest risk will, will take the highest score. Then we will move to into the next column, the high volume, which has the highest volume, emergency or medication or fall or infection rate, which is highest than the other. And the highest will take the highest score, as you can see. After finalizing the scoring, we will tally or we will sum up the, uh, the scores. There are different methodologies or different approaches. Sometimes we multiply the score. Sometimes we uh, only sum the scores. Sometimes we use gaps such as one, uh, three, uh, five, not one, two, three. So it has a different ways, but the point is that we are scoring that uh, opportunities according to criteria in order to objectively identify which is our priority. Okay, where to do this? In the Quality Council. Actually, the Quality Council, because we are not going to do this prioritization by our own. It is not a, a, a job of the quality itself. If we are going to identify where to go, it has to be through the leadership. If you remember the last, uh, the, the first uh, presentation, we were talking about that the head of department choose the uh, improvement and measurement, and then the leadership has to prioritize and to select. And this goes through the quality council. So the quality council is a team that is composed of the leaders and key organizational staff. Their responsibilities is to oversee and to prioritize the quality and performance improvement function organizational-wide what to measure and what to improve for clinical and non-clinical. And as you can see, the Quality Council has a core relationship with other committees. We have the Medical Executive Committees, which a committee that has to discuss everything that is related to medical departments, okay? And we have administrative committees like uh, uh, Environment of Care, FMS, uh, HR department, all of these are reflected in hospital executive and administrative committee. And both of them reports to the quality council. We will, in the quality council, will know something clinical and non-clinical, okay? And under the quality council, there are some committees that has to report to the quality council, like pharmacy committee, sometimes the PNT, pharmacy and therapeutic committee, infection control committee, and performance improvement team if we have uh, and of course, we will be having uh, performance improvement. Okay, so all of these now, we have improvement projects, we have improvement measurement, we know what to do, then we have to put it on a plan. We should, every hospital should have a plan, and this plan has to be hospital-wide, and this plan should identify some points. It should identify our prioritization way. It should identify our structure, who, what is the quality department, what is the composition of the quality council, how the reporting goes, but, but what by what frequency, how, where, how and when do we report to the governing body? Are we going to re report to the governing body on monthly basis, on quarterly basis, and etc. And it also has to identify what is the improvement methodology that we adopt. 
So regardless of the type of the healthcare, every hospital should have a performance improvement plan. It has to be developed by the CEO and the clinical leadership. Do you remember the level of leadership? Uh, the chief of medical, the chief of nursing, the, the, the chief of quality, and it will be approved by the governing body, as we uh, summarized at the last slide in the previous presentation, that the governing body has to approve the uh, quality improvement plan. And as we said, it has to outline the quality improvement focus areas, how you are going to prioritize our... This is uh, an overview on the, com the elements that has to be there in the quality improvement plan purpose, organization and mission, vision and scope of service. Then the goals and objective for this year, it will come from the improvement projects and the operational and strategic initiatives. Then how are we going to identify our customers? What, how do we prioritize our performance uh, opportunities? The structure of the uh, program, quality council, the roles and responsibility, PI team, then approach and methodologies, and we will learn a lot about approach and methodologies, documentation, communication, reporting system, confidentiality, how do we keep these data confidential? And then how are we going to evaluate this program? These objectives has to be monitored and to see that we achieved our targets for the objectives or not. Okay, then the approval. Okay, so at the point number six, we said approach and methodology. So we identified the opportunities. How are we going to implement it? What is our way in order to implement the improvement projects? So we have to select an improvement project. There are a lot of approaches or methodologies that seeks improvement. We will take a look at each one in brief. The most famous one, that's why we are going to uh, talk about it, the last one, which is focus PDSD. Okay, we have the IHI rapid cycle for improvement, and it has been developed by an Institute of Healthcare Improvement. It's a well, very well uh, known organization in the US, and it has some sort of affiliation with Patient Safety Foundation, and they are responsible and about or um, specialized in healthcare improvement. They developed a tool named IHI model for improvement, okay, which is in the middle here. Okay, we have the plan, do, study, act, cycle. We have Lean and Lean Six Sigma, and we have Kaizen. We will try to cover uh, each of it in brief. Okay, we will start by IHI rapid cycle of improvement. It's a way to standardize or to have a stepwise approach in order to implement the improvement. So we will set together, we will formalize a team. We have imp improvement opportunities that we have selected and privatized. And then we will ask ourselves, what are we trying to accomplish? Three questions. What are we trying to accomplish? How will we know that the change is improvement? What change can we make that will result in an improvement? Then we will go for implementation. So the first three question is some sort of planning. A setting target, a setting how are we going to follow that target? and the setting, what are we going to implement to change our current status? Then we will go to implement this using a plan, do, study, act approach. Right. Let's take an example here. What are we trying to accomplish? The first question. In the next six months, increase the rate of beta blocker use in patient at discharge after a myocardial infarction to greater than 90%. So we have identified our area for improvement is patient with myocardial infarction. The best practice says that these patient has to take beta blockers upon discharge. So our project is to improve the implementation of this practice and to ensure that 90% of our patients taking their beta blockers upon discharge. This is our target, this is our aim. Okay, how will we know that the change is improvement? We are going to measure something in order to monitor the progress. So measuring the percentage of patients who have a myocardial infarction and receive a beta blocker at discharge, the implementation of this practice. What are the interventions? What changes that we are going to implement? We are going to educate the physician. We are going to educate the patient family. We are going to have the pharmacist review the discharge medication as a checkpoint. We are going to encourage the nursing to identify beta blockers at discharge. And if we can to have a general a prescription, automatic prescription, 
for those patients who has been identified as MI. If we have the ICD-10 as MI, AMI, so a preliminary prescription will be generated automatically. The patient will have a better level of understanding. So here we set everything. We say what we are trying to do, how to know that uh, we are improving and what measures will be implemented. Then go and do it, plan, do, study, act. In that side. Okay, so identifying a global aim, the first question mostly will be the gap between what we know and what we do. What we do is our current practice and what we do is the best practice. What we know is the evidence-based, is that the patient with myocardial infarction should have a beta blocker on discharge. And what we do is our current practice. Do we apply this or not? What are the gaps in our practice? Why do we not apply this? We, why don't we give the patient beta blockers on discharge? So if we manage to merge the generalized specific scientific evidence, which is the guidelines, along with our particular context, our variation and our processes, how to implement these guidelines on our processes, we can have a measured performance improvement. We can put out steps into implementation and we can measure it and know if we have improvement or not. And that's the main aim of the IHI rapid cycle of improvement because it is a, a healthcare uh, organization in the, the base. So they are thinking always about clinical processes. And that's why they are concentrating on evidence, scientific evidence, generalized basic best practice. We can state our aim as global aim. My global aim is to, is to ta, 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 in the unit, in which unit, and I expect by working on this problem, we will achieve what and why it is important. In order to set an aim, we have to read in the literature first. We need to know what is the best practice in order to know what is our gap. So we have to search for the evidence-based uh, medicine or literature. And here is uh, examples of where to look. If we are going to look for literature, we can go for Cochrane, guidelines.gov, NICE, uh, National Institute of Clinical Excellence for UK, PubMed. All of these websites has guidelines and we have pathways for evidence practice literature. Or we might see what other hospitals from the industry, our industry, made, what success they managed to do. We can search AHRQ. We have a very nice good website, innovations.ahrq.gov. If we went there and you can type, for example, ventilated associated pneumonia or uh, VTE prophylaxis, and you will find that a published papers about improving project that has been done in other hospitals that has been proven successful uh, and what they implemented. So we can learn from this. It's a best practice and we can learn from this. So this is the first step to identify the best practice or the guidelines. Then this is an example of global aim, what we want to accomplish. This example, we aim to improve the efficiency of discharge process at 4N for North, beginning with patient admission and ending with discharge. Benefits, higher patient satisfaction and importance, it will improve the patient outcome and a more coherent discharge process. This is a global aim. This is not a specific yet. Okay, so we need to specify it. In order to work on an improvement project, we should have a specific aim. We should know when to do it, okay? And what is our aim? Are we going to increase or decrease? What metric? Because it has to be measurable. Because we know we need to know when are we going to consider our project successful? So we have to say by what percentage we want to increase or decrease and how it will be the implementation. Let's take examples here. Our clinical manager directed us to reduce falls in patient. Is this a clear aim? No, it lacks, it has the main purpose, but it uh, does not include time frame or measurable goal. If we work on this uh, project, we will not know when can we consider ourselves successful or when should we finish this? Will it start last for one year, for example, or one month? Uh, the next one, it's another unclear on World 2000, reduce patient fall over the next week. But what the problem? It has a clear description about the location, but the time frame is not reasonable. 
okay and it does not has a measurable goal or description of the team but look at the list last one working with falls reduction team on word 2000 we will reduce the rate of patient falls by 25 percent over the next six months clear crisp and clear so they can go and implement it now because they know where to work what is their target and when they shall finish this so this is a smart criteria it is specific measurable attainable reasonable and time bounded okay so now we finish the first part which is identifying only identifying what are we trying to accomplish how will we know that the change is improvement it's like what dr ahmed presented in the last presentation about how to how to measure our performance we have process outcome and the structure but now we are talking about performance improvement so we are not going to tackle that structure we have a process and the outcome so for the for the, the example for reducing time patients spent on ventilator after surgery we will measure number of times the ventilator weaning protocol not following so it's a compliance most probably the process measures are compliance measures did we follow the instructions or the guidelines or the steps or not this is the process the outcome is what should come out of this project if we implemented the proper steps so with the same uh, example number of days patient are on ventilator so this is the outcome if this is increasing we have a problem if not uh, if decreasing so we are going fine Another uh, type of measure is balancing measure. And this is important when you are implementing an improvement project. We should consider if your change or your project may, may harm the process at certain point. For example, we said that we want to decrease the ventilator days, which means that the patient might, might be prematurely extubated, which might increase the rate of free intubation. This is a side effect of our uh, project or our change. This side effect, it, it is not uh, right. It is not how it should go, but it might happen. The physician might, for the sake of improvement, prematurely <clears throat> take the patient out or off the ventilator. So the patient might be reintubated. So we might measure the reintubation rate. So the reintubation rate will represent a balancing measure. We are looking at the system from a different direction and see if we harmed the process from other way around. Okay. So we identified our target. We identified how are we going to measure it. So how, what changes that we can make. So we will set together and see how are we going to improve our problem? Okay. IHI developed a tool in order to see how are we going to select our uh, improvement. For example, if we want to work on eliminating waste, if our target is to eliminate waste or to improve or, optim or to optimize inventory, so go for these actions from 1 to 27 or from 40 to 45 and 71 okay this is not not the complete sheet you will find it free I, I, we can share it with you if you want okay so these are our ideas on how to to implement change if you want if our gap and our target is to improve workflow okay so check for eliminate things that are not used eliminate multiple entries reduce or eliminate overkill reduce control on the system reduce from one to 27, it's a long uh, one. Give people access to information, reduce multiple brands. So you will go to this sheet and you will examine, does this idea match your project? Will it solve your problem or not? Okay, if we chose what to implement, then we will go for plan to study. A plan is to plan for the implementation of the changes. Okay, we have to identify our scope, where are we going to work? Okay, what time of day are we going to try our implementation, our change? Let's say we said that we are going to implement a weaning protocol. Are we, going, we are not going to do it for all patients at a time. We have to examine it with one patient first, the scale. Then we might multiply it with five. And then 
to identify how are we going to measure here in the planning phase we have to identify how are we going to measure the measurement that we identified in the second step the process the outcome and the balance has to be put here as a data collection method who who what where when and how so here is an example the our global aim to reduce infection on unit specific aim reduce all hospital acquired infection by five percent in ccu by 2030 uh, 12, uh, 30 of December 2014, the system assessment for time and availability and the change is to improve hand washing by installing dispensers outside the room. So this is the chain that we will implement in order to reach our target, which is reducing the hospital acquired infection. Then who, what, where, when, how? Who, staff members on team, what we will do, we will install five dispensers and assess number of patient encounters and use dispensers how many encounters that we have and how many dispenser, uh, use of dispenser that we have. Where in five patient room, here is a very important to identify the scale that you are going to implement your change on. We are, going, we are not going to do it for every patient. When two hours per day and we are going to measure it, how using a hand washing other tool. So somebody will go there, will have his tool and we go, he will go, he will monitor the staff using the dispenser, okay? Then do, we plan for the improvement when to implement it and how and how we're going to measure. Do go with the other tool and consider your qualitative data, interview staff. If you found somebody who did not perform the hand hygiene, ask him, why not? What is the problem? Is that a knowledge gap or just non-compliance gap? Comments, notes. And then come, go back to your office, use your data and try to analyze it. Try to see, was the plan carried out or not? Did you collect the data as you planned or not? Does the result match the prediction or not? And here is some sort of uh, study. And data collection plan that Dr. Ahmed presented applies here. We collected the data. We have to monitor, use the histogram, the run and control chart, compare the result using run control chart, and then find out the obstacle. So we planned we implemented we studied and now we have to act on our study 100 percent compliance with dispenser during the day shift next the trial should be with the night shift okay use run chart again if it is good we will standardize the process if we find that everyone has been implementing our change properly with no comments and this is the final result and the outcome is there on the pilot Halas. okay standardize modify your policy and procedure create your new flow chart train everyone and create a kpi and put it on your dashboard if you did not you did find causes for deviation plan it again start again plan do study act find the corrective action and report so this is the ihi rapid cycle improvement <clears throat> Uh, then we will go for another methodology, which is lean thinking. Lean is about doing more and more with, with less and less in order to find our customer. Think of this uh, picture. If you remember that usually we had the whole set with the blood and the wire uh, together. Okay. And usually if we have more than a device with different uh, cables, we used to move with three or four uh, blocks like this, which is actually a redundancy, a repetition, a duplication, because what we need is the cable. We do not need the block. Okay. So when they invented this USP port within the block, we managed to take out a part that it is not of value. It is a repetition. It is a duplication, and that's what we need to do in Lean. We need always to think about the process, if there is any redundancy, any uh, added steps, anything that is not of value, and remove it. This is the, the core of Lean thinking. So we nominate this as waste. If you, if you think of the company that are all the time uh, product producing these kind of chargers, Okay, this is waste, right? This is too much waste on them. You know, Apple in the last uh, 
virgins they do not have the plug they have only the cable okay they standardize their process they consider this as waste they know that everyone that has uh, iphone mobile uh, anything he can use that usb uh, port and he does not want to uh, use this plug so they reduce the waste of resources that they are using and exerting cost. So what we are trying to do is to identify the value within our process. What is value and what is uh, not of value? What is waste? Do you, remember, do you know what is lean? Lean in language mean thin or actually mean uh, well fed. If you go and buy a piece of meat, and you ask the, the, uh, the guy who is giving you the butcher that I needed lean steak. So you mean that you don't want any fat. You want to have it only with meat. So you don't want waste. Fat is waste. Fat is not of value for you. So lean here is that you are trying to get off the fat from the steak. We are trying to get off the fat from the process. We're trying to get off the value, the non-value adding steps. So what we need to know is you are going to check our, our process. We have to identify what is value. We have to check every activity and see if it is of value or not. And being that step is of value, it is from the point of view of the customer. Will the customer or the patient pay for it or not? If the patient is coming to the OPD clinic and he's waiting for to see the patient, is he going to pay for with the waiting time or not? Actually, no. He's paying to see the patient, to be examined, to take medication, to be admitted, not to wait. So waiting is a waste. Waiting is a non-value adding step. So when we examine the process, you will find that we have three types of processes, value added, non-value added, and non-value added, but necessary. A value added is a step that the patient will pay for it, he wants it, and he's coming to our hospital to take it. The non-value added is activities that unnecessarily, and the patient will not pay for it. And the non-value added but necessary, those processes that transform the process from one stage into another. Let's say a specimen has been drawn in the OPD and will be processed in the lab. The specimen shall be transferred from the OPD to the lab. Okay. So this step is necessary, okay? We cannot uh, take it out, okay? Right. Another example is the centrifugation. This is a better example. When we are centrifuging the sample, okay, in order to uh, segregate the cells from the serum, we cannot run the, the test without this process. However, the patient does not want this process but we cannot get rid of this process. We cannot proceed in our system or our steps without this process. The patient is not going to pay because I, will, I want to document, but we cannot not to document. This is a legal issue. This is important and it has to uh, play an important role in the transformation of care and the care communication between healthcare practitioners. Okay. Here's an example between value added and non value added. We will not go through everything. The emergency department patient is the product. If he being evaluated and treated, this is value added. Waiting to be seen is not value added. Clinical laboratory patient specimen is the product. Being centrifuged or tested is value added because it transfused, it, 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 it transformed the, uh, the product or the step. And waiting to be moved as a batch. If we collect the samples and we keep it together, and then we are going to work on it. This is not of value. Okay. So accordingly, we have waste. If we have non-value uh, non added steps, it is considered as waste. And we have eight types of waste. We can have an acronym of downtime. D for defects, O for overproduction, overproduction like the example of the, the charger that I told you about. Waiting is W non-value added processing for the end so this is down and time for transportation inventory motion and employee employee is talking about underutilized 
if we have an unsatisfied employee that is not well performing, this is a waste. So employee is human resources. Here is another example for everyone. Defect is anything that has been done wrong, so we have to repeat it again. Any repetition to correct a thing is a waste. If we did it from the first time, it will not be there. So defect is waste. Overproduction, I told you an example, transportation. And here is transportation, we are talking about product, patient, specimen, material. If we are transporting a thing or an object from one place to another, okay? Waiting, you know, waiting, inventory. If we have a crowded inventory, if we have expired materials, this is waste, okay? Motions, our steps, it's the staff steps, the movement between the, uh, uh, the lab to the, uh, the OPD in order to collect the sample. This is waste. If we designed the lab uh, that we have a seed at the centrifuge in one place and the machine is the last at the end of the wing. So all this motion is a waste. Overprocessing too much stamps, too much signature, this is overprocessing. Human potential, we said that unutilized uh, employee, burned out employee are considered waste. Okay, so what we want to do is to have the value streamed to the patient without waste. It's like removing the fat from the meat. We want to remove every non-value added steps and keep only the value added steps. And if we have a value, a non-value added steps, but necessarily, we are trying to re-engineer the process to think of a way to minimize its time. So what we do is to form a cross-functional team, go into a walkthrough, visit the process, do a jimba. Jimba means front line or walkthrough. We will map the process and then we will examine according to our map, the value added steps and the non-value added steps. We have to identify our scope, where are we going to start and when, when we are going to start to stop in order to examine the process uh, properly. As I told you, schedule for a walkthrough, go for the, the place itself. Do not estimate, do not work from memory. You have to walk the process. You have to observe, observe the process by yourself. You have to count the steps. You have to count the time in order to know what is the gaps, what are the causes and where is the waste. You can use stopwatch to measure time. We can use pedometer to, uh, to count the, the steps. We can use the observation sheet, cameras, in order to see the inventory, how the inventory is not well prepared, etc. This is uh, a tool to uh, monitor the time observation. And here we are going to write the steps. And then we are going to measure every step. How does it long? We can measure each cycle and we can identify the uh, outliers and here in the uh, the last right the, the, the most right part the column we can write uh, the point observe it that caused uh, prolongation or minimize the uh, the time so we can learn from the process we can find the gap we can measure the gap so we can work on it then we will have to plot it on a value stream map the value stream map have, has a specific uh, uh, simple, but the, the simple is not the idea. The idea is to identify the steps, identify the non-value at the step and that, and to identify the value at the step. You can use this uh, this view. The non-value at the step is up there, and the value at is down there. And then we will identify the causes of uh, non-value at steps. Why it was too long? Too long. We will measure the value at steps in eight minutes and then value at step 28 minutes. Okay, so the total was 37, almost 37 minutes. Then identify the causes and work on to develop a future map in order to improve. So the lean is an idea is to find out the waste and to remove it. Another way of improving. So now we are talked about IHI rapid cycle of improvement and we talked about uh, lean. Uh, the last part, uh, not not last, we have still one part, but Six Sigma. Six Sigma is another methodology, another stepwise process in order to implement improvement. Uh, it, it has an acronym of DMAKE, D for define, define area for improvement, define your problem, then measure, 
measure your current status, measure your uh, causes, analyze your measurement, find out what is most common causes that leads to your gap, and then improve, find out solutions and go improve it and control, put your control measures, measure how are you going to monitor your improvement. So it's almost the same, the same idea. All of them are in the same way. It is a little bit different. So what is very specific about Six Sigma? Do you remember the in Dr. Ahmed the presentation? He talked about the bell-shaped curve and he talked about the standard deviation. Okay, the sigma is the standard deviation. Okay, the, the simple sigma represents the standard deviation. And if you remember, if we're working on three sigma, most of the good of the data will lie within 99.7%. So 0.3% only will be outside of the uh, standard deviation. What if we work it on, this is a plus or minus three, six, uh, three sigma. If we work on six sigma, okay, so we are working on 99.99966. So our opportunity is to fail is almost one per million. Okay, and that's what six sigma is good about. We are trying to minimize the opportunity for failure. So in order to do it, to do this, we have to calculate the sigma level. I will not go into the equation again. Uh, however, this is the core of six sigma. If you cannot measure the sigma level, so do not go for six sigma. If you don't have enough data to measure your sigma level, you will not be able. You will not be able to identify what is your current sigma, and accordingly, what improvement will come out of this. You need to calculate your opportunities and your defects per, per opportunity. And let's take uh, a quick example. If you have in the lab, we are reporting every day 1,000 results. And 10% are not reported. So those are defects. So the number of opportunities for defects is three, representing three phases of testing. We might fail to report because of failure in the pre-analytical process analytical or post-analytical. So each test has three opportunities of failure. Each ED test from that 1,000 has three opportunities to fail. So our opportunities to fail is 1,000 multiplied by three. So we have 3,000 opportunities to fail. However, our defects is only 100. So 100 results has been not reported within time, over 3,000 opportunity to fail. It means that our defects per bear opportunity is 0.03. If we make it up to 1 million, okay, so we will multiply this into 1 million, okay, and this will mean 33,000, okay opportunity to fail by million. So if we work, this mean, this number mean that our sigma is 96%, okay? 96% is our outcome, okay? Which means three sigma or 3.3 .3 sigma. If we calculated our sigma and we know that our sigma is 3.3, .3, .3, we want to reach that six sigma, which will yield, will come out with yield, of 99.99966%. So we are decreasing the level of sigma. If you cannot do this, don't go for six sigma. Six sigma is always related to statistics and data. Okay. Uh, our next uh, approach is the most famous, as I told you, focus, I'm sorry for the spelling mistake, it's focus PDSA. Focus F stands for find a process to improve. O, organize a team. C, clarify the current knowledge or process. U, uncover root causes or variation. S, select a process to improve. And then the regular plan to study act that we presented in the IHI rapid cycle. So it is almost, as you can see, most of them are the same 
idea. We have to identify a problem. We have to know what are the causes of the problem, find out the solution, and go implement it using a PDSA or any cycle, any way to implement it. Okay. Uh, now we presented every uh, methodology uh, regarding uh, quality improvement. Now we are going to briefly mention the tools. What are the tools that might help us during these steps? I will use the Focus PDSA as a model in order to reflect the tools, but it can be implemented in any other step or any other methodology as far as that we know why do we use this tool. And we will go through it now. I think you will get it. Okay. When we are talking about uh, Focus PDSA, F stands for find an improvement project. By the way, if we are talking about IHI rapid cycle improvement, we were talking about what is our aim. So it's finding opportunity to improve. So we can use the same tools. Okay. What are the tools? We said that we might have a KPI, iterating KPI. We might have a specific review, or we might have a centering event, as I told you at the beginning. Or we might not, we might want to think what to do. So we will go for brainstorming. We will set together to generate ideas for improvement. We will perform a brainstorming. If we did a brainstorming, we have to be followed up by a diagram, multi-voting and prioritization metrics. Those are the three tools that, or four tools that you use in this step, how to find a problem or how to find an opportunity for improvement or it might be how to find a solution. In this step, we are going to use tools to generate ideas, to select one of the ideas, and then to prioritize and how to do this. We will start with brainstorming. Brainstorming is a way, a structured <clears throat> way, in order to come out with a lot of ideas in one session. Okay, how to do it? It might be structured or unstructured. First thing that, that the coordinator, which will be the quality, most, most probably will be the quality professional, he will state why do we set, why do are we here? We, we are here to find out a problem that we want to improve, or we are here to find out a solution for a problem. So whenever we, are, we want to generate a lot of ideas, we are going to use a brainstorm. In the structured, everyone in the group gives an idea in rotation. So we will go by round. One from the right, then the next, the next, the next, and whoever does not have an idea, he will say pass. The other structure will keep the flow. Whoever has an idea will raise his hand and he will interfere and say, what is the idea? Okay. Then we will be having a list of generated problems, indicators, ideas, solution, and whatever. Okay. Here is the steps of the uh, The rules here that no criticism, no evaluation, no discussion. In this step, we do not want to interrupt the, fl the, the flow of thoughts. We want everyone to express himself without hesitation. So there is no stupid ideas. Anyone will say an idea, we will accept it for now. Then we might say that he is stupid later, but not for now. Okay. The wilder, the better. All ideas are equal. Okay. Now we have a bunch of ideas. Let's organize it. The how to organize it, we are using a tool named affinity diagram. Affinity diagram is some sort of categorization. Affinity means the relationship, connection, similarity. So we will put our ideas and then we will examine the similarities between ideas. And at this point, we can say that this idea is stupid. Not stupid, but we can clarify what do you mean by this, by this idea. And we can find the similarities. Is it duplicated or not? Or it will be different idea than other person from the diff a different aspect. So we will put it together. And I will give you example. Okay. Here we are setting to identify possible performance measures for FMS department. So a lot of ideas here. Percentage of purity, trace methods, maintenance costs, of environmental accident, material cost, all of these ideas have been generated. Now we want to, to find a way to segregate it, to categorize it. So we will put everything together that are related, and then we will find a topic 
or eligible for this group. Let's say purity and trace metals, color, vis color viscosity, PPM water, uh, test for complaint, all, all of these are ideas to measure product quality. However, over time, cost, maintenance time, yield, utility cost, those are manufacturing cost. Uh, here, the, down there is safety and environmental. Number of OSHA, recordables, uh, environmental accident, housekeeping scores, are of the, all of these are safety and environment. So we are trying to group ideas in order to organize our thinking and identify what are the aspects that we can work on. If we are sitting together to identify areas for improvement, we might find areas in OPD, for example, related to registration, related to uh, waiting time, uh, related to uh, lab investigation. So a lot of things might come out and we can group it. So we can know where to go. Okay, after this, we want to minimize these tools. We are not going to work on all of them. So we have two ways. The first one is multi-voting. Multi-voting is a subjective way. We, what we do that we have the list of the, uh, of the ideas, we will number it. And then we will ask the participant to score, to give a score to each idea. And they have limited number of points. Let's say that we have 20 uh, thoughts. So each member will have only 10 votes and those 10 votes will be distributed over the 20 uh, ideas. So he has to exclude some ideas that he thinks that they are not important. Everyone will do that and then the coordinator will tally the votes for each idea. And those ideas that has the highest tally will be with us and those ideas that has no votes will be excluded. Okay, so the goal of this process is to come out with a vital few or critical few ideas. Okay, before going into multi-voting, we have to consider similarities, redundancies. If we have any redundancy, we have to uh, duplicate to combine duplication or to uh, amend similar ideas. And then we have, as I told you, number each item on the list. And then you have two ways of voting scores, either one half plus one rule or total number of items divided by number of team members. One half plus one rule, the example that I told you, we have 20 ideas, so the half of them is 10. So each one will have one half is 10 plus one, so 11. So each member have 11 votes to be distributed over the ideas. This is the first way. The second way is to Divide the number of ideas over the number of stuff. So we have 20 ideas and five stuff, 20 over five. So everyone has four votes to be distributed over their ideas. And then we will form our tallies. Okay. So, so after the multi voting, we have minimized the list from 20 ideas into six, into five, into seven, not more than eight ideas. So we can go to select one option. To select one option, we have to prioritize more objectively. And more objectively, we have to use the prioritization methods as we described it before. We have to identify the criteria, set the, uh, our ideas, and then to score it and to select one idea. Okay, at this point, we finished the F find improvement opportunity. We identified what to work on. Then we will go for the O. And the O is organize a team. We have three tools that might help us during team formation and teamwork. The first one is the most easy task list. We were going to have the task or the steps who is responsible when he will be completing it. The other way is the Gantt chart. The Gantt chart is like the task list. We are identifying what are the steps, however, we are identifying when to use it on a graphical representation, not only a due date. So we can know every step and we can visualize when are we going to finish and the relationship between each step and the other step. The last tool is the storyboard. And in the storyboard, we have a visual display of our uh, improvement or our uh, way of work. Okay, it can help us to be to come on the same page, everyone, and we can communicate our work to the staff and to the higher management and to the quality council 
and to our colleagues. This is the uh, how it will be presented. As you can see, we have FOCUS, find, organize, uh, clarify, understand, select. And in each step, we will put at a, a step, uh, uh, we will write something that is relevant to the step. Yani for the F, we wrote here the gap analysis finding. So now we identified our opportunity for improvement. In O, we wrote what is our team. In C, we draw a flow chart in uh, and you, we uh, we uh, put the, the variation in the process. So the storyboard will be built during the uh, improvement project going on. Okay, then we can go for the plan, do, study, act. Every step that I can, that I finish, I can put a represented graph or picture or a statement about it on the storyboard. So everyone will be on board. The staff will see the progress. We can identify where are we or where do we stand. Okay, so we finished F O, then C clarify the current process. Go and understand the current process. And we have a very important and very famous tool here, which is the flow chart. We have to go and draw a flow chart to identify our current process and how it works. This is how do clarify the process? This is the C. The flow chart represents the actual sequence of the steps and the relationship between each step or not. And it will clarify if we have ideal sequence of step. Okay, so we can use it to now to uh, clarify the current process and we can use it to clarify what proper process can be done after the improvement. The sequence is important. The oval shape is for start and end. The rectangle for process step. The diamond for decision, yes or no. And the, o, the, and the, the circle is for connector. If we are connecting two pages or two steps to it. When to use the flow chart, as we said, when we trying to identify and describe the current process. When we to question if there is a process or not, to know the variation within the process, to know if the process is meeting a policy and procedure or not, to analyze the problem or to design or redesign a process into a new process. How to interpret the flowchart? First of all, examine your flowchart after drawing it. If there are any bottlenecks, if there are any delay, an effective sequence, somebody is doing something or a step before another one, if the step is poorly defined, the responsibility is not pro properly defined, if we wrote a step, let's say medication is dispensed, who disp medication is prepared. This is a poorly defined step. The step should clarify who do what and what is the outcome of the step. So it has to be written as preparation, uh, medication is being prepared by the floor nurse. Okay. Or medication shall be prepared in the IV room by the pharmacist. So the process has been has to be clearly identified or clarified. Then we have to examine the decision sample because decision sample means variation. It's yes or no. And yes or no, it might go into a rework loop. If no, let's say that physician want to endorse the medication to the nurse. So nurse is available or not? If yes, it will go straight forward. If no, he will search for it and a waste will be there. So most probably decision samples has variation and you need to look at it, okay? Examine the rework as we said, and find, you can find out as well from the flow chart, the value at steps that we mentioned in the uh, lean thing. Okay, so now we understand, uh, we clarified the process, go to understand the root causes of your performance. What are the causes that leading to this gap that you want to improve. And then the root causes, I will not uh, clarify a lot, except only one tool, which is the fishbowl, okay? When we are try, uh, trying to understand the root causes, we have two situations or three situations. We might have a real data, if we have a central event or an event, so we are, we are going to grab the data that already happened, or we might not have a real data, so we will set together and we will 
think over what are the causes of the problem, what are the root causes of the problem. And in the next presentation, Dr. Ahmed will clarify uh, a lot of tools about five whys and how to search for root causes in uh, root cause analysis. Fishbone, what we do in Fishbone, I will go directly to the uh, graph. We write at the right, in the right, we state the problem. What is the problem? Patient wait for bed. Okay. Then we draw a horizontal line, okay, with an arrow. And then we have to draw lines that are almost vertical over that horizontal line in order to identify what are the main contributing factors in this situation. What might cause the patient to wait for bed? It might be the machine, the system, the timing, resources. It might be the medical procedures. It might be the hospital procedure, and it might be communication. Those are the main culprits or the main causes, factors. We can go for five M's and five P's for the same, for the main factors. Uh, five M's is people, provision, policies, procedure, place. So we can put these and then go under this as root causes. Or five M's, manpower, material, machine, method, measurement. Then under each factor, we will see what are the root causes that might happen related to this factor. So if we are talking about the machine and here we are talking about the system, is the system incorrect? The data is not entered or it is not used. Why it is not used? Because it is the function is not useful or it needs more training or there is no trust in the system or it's not used because we have bending the chart. Okay, so again, the same rule, uh, horizontal and longitudinal, horizontal or semi-vertical one, in order to find the root cause. So after this exercise, we will come out with all possible causes that might lead to this problem. So what to do next? Again, Dr. Ahmed presentation, plan for data collection, find out what are the most frequent problems that happens that contribute with your gap. Find out the most critical, the vital few causes. You remember Pareto? Here Pareto is important. If we went with all these causes and we counted, what are the frequency of the system is incorrect? What is the frequency of the nursing shortage? What is the frequency that the delay was that the patient, the, the staff was on, on break? So we can find out what are the most frequent occurring causes and those are the causes that we are going to focus on while we are selecting a solution so next step of course is selecting solution now we know our causes we know after studying and data collection we know what are the most common causes then go to study to select an opportunity for improvement we have three tools here. Brainstorming, again, we said that brainstorming, we are going to use it to generate ideas. And here we want to generate ideas. So we might use brainstorming. We might use a prioritization matrix of we use the brainstorming. And another tool, which is force field analysis. In force field analysis, we are trying to see if we have a driving forces that will make the implementation of my solution easy or restraining forces or opposition forces and that will oppose the implementation of my solution. And here's an example. This is the tool. We are going to write what are we going to implement here in the issue. We are going, going to try to memorize, to find out what are the driving forces that will ease my implementation and what are the restraining forces that will oppose my implementation. And we might write down what are the actions that will reduce the restraining force. Here is a good example. This is a force field analysis on the pre-anesthesia clinic. It was an idea in one hospital, and they want to know, is it easy to be implemented or not? So up there in the upper part is the barriers, the restraining forces. It is expenses. They, there will be expense. The anesthesiologist might not like to have a new role to go and sit in the clinic. Other hospitals fail to implement it. We have shortage of staff. And surgeon does not 
trust anesthesia clinic preparation. They might cancel the patient or postpone the patient. So those are barriers in implementing the solution. However, we have uh, driving forces that it will remove complaints. It will reduce the cancellation rate and accordingly it will remove the complaints. Our anesthesia department is involved. Our head of department is part of the team. So this will reduce the resistance. We have the management support and it is a very simple idea. So all of these are driving forces. So how to overcome the barriers? We will perform a cost benefit analysis for the expenses. We will review our plans with HR to cover the shortage and we will verify the reliability of the new process with a pilot. We will start the pilot and be sure that it is successful and then we will show that uh, surgeon that the pilot is successful and this process will improve the work. Okay, now we selected a solution, plan, do, study, act, just as we said in the, the IHI rapid side reporting program. Put a plan, what, who, when, uh, and what are the needs to be collected, go implement it and then collect your data. And again, as far as we are talking about data, all information display and management uh, tool that has been presented by Dr. Ahmed will be implemented here. Okay, uh, we're not there yet. I told you it won't be easy. It is very big board, but we finished almost most of it. We have minor parts there. <laughs> Just taking a sip of water. Okay, now we knew how to develop a structure for quality improvement. We know how, what are the methodologies for quality improvement and what tools that we can benefit in order to implement these methodologies. Now we will go to understand what are the quality improvement team. As we said that the quality improvement has to go through teams because Quality professional, quality professional does not know everything about every process. So he has to use the benefit of having a process owners and the process owners know everything about the process. So the quality professional will go with his methodology, his tools and try to generate ideas and find out solutions and the causes from the process owner. That's how we are going to work as a team. Why do we work as a team? Because what is the team? Group of people working together to achieve common purpose that they are hold themselves mutually accountable. Because we are together, we want to perform the improvement. So together we work on achieving this goal and we are accountable and committed to this. When do you use a team? When the task is complex and we want to have creative ideas and we if we have a multi-disciplinary or cross-functional process. That's the picture that I was talking about earlier. If we have a team and the team is working together so we can understand what is the elephant better than person. Okay, how to choose your team? We might highlight your high level process. Okay, then to see who are the customer of every process and select the team. Here is the improvement team. We should have a system leader a team member with technical expertise, a day-to-day -day leader and executive sponsor. Okay. In order to have an effective team, we should have clear goals, clear roles, clear expectation, feedback, and respect. Okay. This is how to be effective in a team. That's why we have to set a smart goal. If you remember, having a smart goal will make our problem Simpler, we can work together. We have a clear problem, we have clear goal. Okay, then clear rules and expectations, feedback and respect. Team behavior is important. So setting ground rules and balancing advocacy and inquiry within a team is important. What are the ground rules? Attendance, for example, attendance is expected, actively participate, follow assignments, keep side talks to the minimum. So those are the ground rules we have to set in order to set our team on track and being effective. Okay, balancing advocacy and inquiry. Okay, how to state your opinion. You might advocate for your opinion, so say it directly. Okay, 
However, try to make it in testable chunks. Do you remember when we said that participatory manager or leader draft an idea? Here is the where do we use this? Present your conclusion as option. Does not say this is the right way. That's what we're going to implement. No. What do you think about this? My idea is to do one, two, three, etc. And share reasoning. Why do you think that your idea is important? This is how to present your ideas. How to inquire from other people, okay? You have to test your understanding. You have to explore others' reasoning. You have to confirm, do you understand? Let me clarify. Am I understanding you right? You, you mean one, two, three, okay? So we have to be on clear pieces and understanding. Try to hear from different people and encourage change. So these steps are important in order to be an effective team. Team roles are important. We have to identify and set who will do what, okay? And the rules has to be team recorded. Somebody has to take the minutes and to record. Timekeeper, somebody has to work on the time frame, like what we are doing right now, okay? So the timekeeper will come now and raise his hand and tell me, please note that you are almost, uh, uh, almost up to the time. Don't, don't take more time than this. Okay, so the timekeeper will highlight the time and the team will agree, are they going to move on into another item or they were going to continue on this item. The process owner, as I told you, day to their leader, day to their uh, manager and the sponsor. And the sponsor will be somebody from the leadership who will align the resources and monitor progress. Mostly it will be the medical director or the chief uh, operating officer or the chief executive. Let's say you are working on, let's say, the ventilator associated pneumonia, okay? Most probably the medical director will be the sponsor. He will give us resources. He will uh, let us meet. He will open meeting rooms. He will give us uh, resources or training or material that we need in order to implement our solution. So this is the sponsor. Whoever is supporting from the leadership that's supporting the, the, pro, the, uh, the project. Uh, facilitator. And this one will be the quality professional. He is the one who is concerned about the problem solving, other learning, communication, interpersonal. He has to be skilled. That's why we are talking about the tools. The facilitator will teach everyone how to use the tools, how to understand the process, how to take decisions, and etc. Okay, seven steps to meeting process. Now we set the ground, the ground rules. We know everyone's uh, responsibility, what to do within the meeting. First, first of all, assign team roles, as we said. Ground rules has to be identified. Clarify the object of the meeting. Why do we meet? There should be an agenda. Review the agenda, then go through the agenda type, uh, items. And we here we are going to manage the discussion, as I told you according to the ground rules and advocacy, balancing advocacy and inquiry. Summarize the content at the end of the meeting and plan for the next meeting. When are we going to meet? What are the next agenda? And it is important to evaluate the meeting. What went wrong? Did we follow up the timeline or not? Uh, did we participate or not? Do we have feedback from everyone or not? Okay. Uh, okay, that's it. I finished. Uh, almost on time. We have five minutes for uh, questions. To sum up, we talk about quality improvement, uh, performance teams, quality improvement tools, quality improvement methodologies, and uh, quality improvement plan and structure. Any questions? I see Talent raising her hands before the, uh, the beginning of the presentation, Dr. Muhammad. Okay, I didn't notice. Please, Ms. Talat. Talat, you can talk. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, sorry, it was by mistake because oh, I just okay. the, the call was coming and I want to disconnect the call, so my, my hand raised. That's it. Good to hear from you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Any question, please?
I think that we don't have any question here. So, uh, so we'll take um, 30 minutes break. It will be a long break. Then we'll yeah. start back at 2.30. And inshallah, my presentation, which is will be the last part for patient safety, will not take more than 30 minutes. So we'll see you at 2.30, please.
So I will be starting, inshallah, in four minutes. We'll start at 2.30. So please be with us. So thank you all for being with us for the whole day. Uh, we come to our last part in the CPHQ uh, body of knowledge or domains, which is the patient safety. Patient safety is one of the easiest and straightforward domains in all the, the domains for the aspects of CPHQ. So inshallah, if you are planning to take the exam um, or, or you took the exam before, you know that this is the most straightforward part. So inshallah, I will finish within 30 minutes and you'll be free to go after 30 minutes. So the first rule of patient safety is first do no harm. So don't do harm to the patients. It's very straightforward and very clear to, 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 it, to, to all of us. So as per the AHRQ, it's a very good, as mentioned by Dr. Abdel Gawad, it's the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. It's a very good resource for that has a lot of papers related to quality and patient safety. So according to AHRQ, the definition of patient safety is a discipline in the healthcare sector that applies safety science methods toward the goal of achieving a, str a trustworthy system of healthcare delivery. Also patient safety is an attribute of healthcare system which minimizes the incidence and impact of adverse events and maximizes the recovery from them. So the definition of error. <clears throat> error is the failure of a planned action to be completed as intended or use of a wrong inappropriate or incorrect plan. So in errors, 
we have either error of commission, which is doing something wrong, or error of omission, which is failing to do the right thing. And either commission or omission will lead to undesirable outcome or significant potential for such an outcome. So for example, ordering a medication for a patient with documented allergy to that medication would be an act of commission. So we did something wrong. We didn't take the patient allergy as in the, in the history part. Um, another example, failing to prescribe a proven medication with major benefits for an eligible patient, like low dose of unfractioned heparin uh, for VTE prophylaxis for a patient after hip replacement surgery would be a present an error of omission. So failing to do the right thing. So commission is doing something wrong while omission is failing to do the right thing. So if you can see here, this diagram, it shows that we have all the errors here and we have most of the errors are near misses and most of the adversaries, I will go back to, I will go in the, in the coming slides into the definitions of, of uh, everything, of adverse events, near misses and even sentinel events. So for adverse events, there are non-preventable adverse events and there are preventable adverse events. Preventable adverse events, most of them are due to negligent actions or careless behavior, which we don't tolerate, of course. So adverse event, definition of adverse event is an injury that was caused by medical management or complication instead of the underlying disease and that resulted in either prolonged hospitalization or disability at the time of discharge from medical care or both. So there is something wrong happened and reached to the patient and caused injury to the patient, either prolonged the stay or make disability to the patient. While near miss is an event or close call is an event that almost happened or an event that didn't happen, but no one knows about. If the person involved in the near miss doesn't come forward, no one may ever know about it. And as I said, in other, in other uh, uh, like healthcare, healthcare uh, industries or, or other like difference between American and British, they call it close call, which is an event, a situation that didn't produce a patient injury, but only because of chance. But if it's recurrent or happened again, it might cause a sentinel event or it might cause an adverse event. While sentinel event by, by JCI and, and Sebahi definitions, it's an unexpected occurrence involving death or major permanent loss of function. Like an example, medication error, any preventable event that may cause inappropriate medication use or jeopardize patient safety. So here is the Swiss cheese models or model. It presents three things. It presents a target, which is the patient. It present, presents here, the Swiss cheese layers are the barriers that we should have in the systems. And here we have the gaps that happened in our system, which is caused by something called either latent errors or active errors. And I will also talk about this. For example, here I have the culture barrier or defense, training barrier, physical barriers, and procedure barriers. Here I have a gap that disease managed protocol missing or not action. It's a procedure barrier, a procedure gap, or a gap went through the procedure barrier that we have. Then we have poor compliance, poor supplies, physical barrier, inadequate knowledge or lack of training opportunities. It's a hole in the training barrier. No clear leadership, no cohesive team structure. It's a hole also in the culture barrier. So usually we, we, we use this um, uh, Swiss cheese model during um, RCAs or investigating anything that, that cause patient harm. So now the, the difference between active failures and latent failures. Active failure is applied by James Reason. He's one of the, of the, the gurus also in the just culture and the patient safety. And there is a model that I'm gonna show you after, after some slides that shows his, um, his just culture algorithm. So um, uh, in general, active failures are those errors made by those who provide direct care to the patients such as nurses and physicians. Active errors usually occur at the point of care or the point of contact between human and some aspect of larger systems like human and machine interface. For example, 
setting up the IV infusion pump with wrong setting, uh, uh, ignoring the alarm, uh, like any, any critical care alarm, turning off the alarm, and so on. So there is another terminology for active failure, which is called sharp end. Also, there are errors that happen at the sharp end are noticed first because they are committed by the person closest to the patient. Another example, nurse giving wrong dose to heparin, of heparin to six babies, which is like active failure. Another example is programming the IV pump incorrectly. But the latent errors, or the blunt end. So we have active errors, sharp ends, and latent errors, or latent failures, or the blunt end. So these are within the system. These are the failures or the, 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 the errors that happens within the system. So the facility, the equipment, and processes that contribute with the active failures to produce error or allow them to happen. So usually latent, fail latent failures arise because of lack of standardization of equipment and processes. Also poor, visib poor visibility, high noise levels, and excessive movement of patients. So as I said, also it's referred as a blunt end. So latent errors, it's all the many layers of the healthcare system that affects the person holding the scalpel. So if you remember the, the barriers that we have, most of the, of, the, of the gaps in the barriers is because of latent errors. So these are less apparent failures of the organization design that contribute to the error and allow it to happen. For example, pharmacy tech put wrong heparin in machine, pharmacists fail to catch, look alike of labels, no board coding, technology, etc. Also examples of latent errors, we have lack of computer warnings, unclear policies and procedures, incomplete patient information such as missing allergy. And I think that we can relate about this one because we had uh, like experience with some, some sentinel events related to patient allergy. Um, uh, so in the system approach, error reduction is obtained by building barriers and safeguards into equipment and technology and processes. So I will give you like a case like post-operative patient, patient is allergic to penicillin, order was written for timentin or tricercillin, antibiotic was administered, patient had anaphylactic shock and cardiac arrest. As I just said, it's, we can relate this incident. So if you can see here, it's a mix of the latent error and active errors. We have the fax system for ordering medications is broken, nurse borrows medication from another patient, the pneumatic tube system for obtaining medication was broken, um, nurse give the patient a medication to which he is allergic, then we had a problem with the ICU nurse staffing. So the outcome was the patient arrest and dies. So according to James Reason, remember this name because we will say, we'll talk a lot about him. According to James Reason, there are two types of actions or unsafe acts, intended actions and unintended actions. Intended actions are either basic error types, which is violation and mistakes, which leads to, if it's violation, it will be routine, reason, reckless, and malicious behavior due to this. If it's mistake, it will be rule and knowledge-based errors. So they don't know. For the rules, they don't know. For the mistakes related to the rules, they don't know what, what should, should they do. But Intended, like routine, they know the game. For violations, they know the rules, but they choose not to follow the rules. There are unintended actions, which are due to either lapses or slips. It, it related, it's related to skill-based errors. It's like memory failure. I will talk now about the system design thinking um, uh, and skill-based errors related to attentional failures. Now I'll leave you with this slide for 15 seconds. What I want you to do is to look at the chart and say the color of the word, not the word itself. I will just be silent for 15 seconds. So it's difficult. I think it's difficult to everyone. 
So it's difficult because at the end we are human beings. We have limited memory capacity, which may be further reduced by fatigue, stress, hunger, illness, language or culture, cultural factors, hazardous attitudes. So what we should do? We should apply human factors thinking to your work environment, like to avoid the reliance on memory, make things visible, visible, like cautionary labels, review and simplify processes, standardize common processes and procedures, and routinely use checklists. There is, there is a very good book by, by, by a doctor called Atul Gawandi called The Checklist Manifesto. I advise you all to, to look into this one. Very nice resource. So here we have two views on the system versus human, or the old view and the new view related to errors. So the old view says that human error is a cause of accident. To explain failure, you must seek human failure, which is wrong. We have to find, in the old view, find people's incorrect assessments, wrong decisions, bad judgment, and get rid of bad apples replaced with new personnel which if you don't have the process, the proper process and proper system, they will fail, of course. But in the new view, we know that error is a symptom of deeper trouble. We explain failure, look for the system failure. Whenever we're doing RCA, we, we do our best to look for the system failures, not the human failure. In the new view, we explore how actions and assessments made sense at time. And we're replacing people leaves problem in place. So in the Institute of Medicine to Air is Human report, they have categorized um, the errors that can occur into three categories. And they told us what to do with the three categories. Either it's a human error or at risk behavior, or reckless behavior. So if it's a human error, it's a product of our current system design, which a nurse forgot to do the two hours check. So maybe there is something in the process, maybe there's something in the procedure, in the training, in the design, in the environment. So in this human error, we should act like console. We have to, we have to go revisit the procedures, the procedures, we have to provide training and so on. And there is a risk behavior, a choice, like risk believed in significant or justified. And here is an example. I did one person transfer with a resident who requires a two person transfer because the resident needed to use the bathroom and everyone else was busy. So they know that it's a risk behavior, but they do it. So how can we manage? We manage this by coaching, like removing incentives for at-risk behaviors, creating incentives for healthy behaviors, increasing situational awareness. And the third type of errors is the reckless behavior. The reckless behavior is a conscious disregard of unjustifiable risk. Like this example, I knowingly avoided completing a treatment because it's complex and time consuming. So, he or she know that, that this is a very risky behavior, but they decided to do this. So at this case, we have to punish, we have to take disciplinary action. So in the Institute of Medicine strategy to improve patient safety, they, they are recommending to establish a national focus to create leadership tools, research protocols, and to, to increase the knowledge base about patient safety. Also to identify and learn from errors by developing a nationwide public mandatory reporting system, as well as encouraging healthcare system practitioners and so on. And we, here we have um, a very good example uh, with, with the Saudi Patient Safety uh, Center and the taxonomy. They are unifying um, all the reportable incidents in one taxonomy, and they were working to unify even the system to have like a national database on this. Um, and of course, it's nationally voluntary reporting system or raising performance, expectation, and standards for improvement in patient safety through the professional organization, group purchasers, and so forth within healthcare, which is insurance, DRGs. Also, we have uh, a lot of national movements here regarding this area. 
and implementing patient safety systems in healthcare organization and systems to ensure safe practices at the delivery end. So this shows us, this diagram shows us the difference between the approaches across the time or across the, 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 the eras from, for patient safety. So at first it was punitive culture. So transparency was impossible in, 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 in punitive culture. Then people tried to remove this kind of culture. They, so they, they adopted something called blame-free culture, which doesn't add accountability to anyone who is doing anything wrong. Then now the current approach or the, the, the best approach is the just culture. We have to optimally support a system of safety. So it's neither a punitive or a blame-free. It's a just. We don't tolerate reckless behavior with this, in this culture. So as I said, recently introduced in safe practices is the concept of fair and just culture. So when leaders begin asking what happened instead of who made the error, and that's what we're trying to do in all our day-to-day -day operations, uh, in a fair and just culture, everyone throughout the organization will be aware of the medical errors are inevitable. We cannot, we cannot prevent errors, but all errors and unintended events are reported, which is the culture we're trying to work on even when the event may not cause patient injury, like near misses, like we mentioned before. So a just culture that recognizes that competent professionals make mistakes and acknowledges that even competent professionals develop unhealthy norms, like shortcuts or routine, routine rule violation. And we have also an example that I'm not gonna say for, for a routine rule violation, but it comes from, uh, it came from a very competent and experienced professional that we know in the hospital and it led into a serious event or a central event. But they shouldn't be held accountable for system failings over which they have no control. So in just culture, we have three principles. Like that a just culture is not an effort to reduce personal accountability and discipline. No, of course, we, we focus on accountability and it adds accountability to everyone. It's a way to emphasize that the importance of learning from mistakes and near misses to reduce errors in the future. That's why we encourage reporting. In fair and just culture, an individual is accountable to the system. And the greatest error is to not report a mistake and thereby prevent the system and other from learning. So sometimes you found all of us, all everyone working in quality and risk management, they found like this department or that department asking his subordinates not to report anything to quality through SMT course because they think that it's individualized and they take it personal and so on. But of course, this practice is very risky and we don't encourage at all. So policies that would discourage any healthcare provider from self-reporting errors are at odds with the goals of a fair and just culture. The third principle is when all serve as safety advocates regardless of their positions within the organization. But these providers and consumers will feel safe and supported when they report medical errors or near misses and voice their concerns about patient safety. As I said many times before that this culture has zero tolerance for reckless behavior. We cannot tolerate uh, reckless behavior. So um, uh, healthcare organizations committed to fair and just culture, we have to identify and correct the system and processes of care that contributed to the medical error and near misses. So they don't assign blame, but we have to assign accountability. So this is the detailed, I'll walk you through the detailed James Reason uh, uh, culture of safety or just culture uh, algorithm. So if you start here, when something uh, like happened, we have to ask ourselves or to ask the whoever committed or omitted the error, was the job understood? If yes, we'll ask him again. Were the action as intended? If yes, we'll ask him, were the results as intended? If yes, this means that this was a sab sabotaging and, and uh, like intended act. So at this case, we have to go with this red color, like severe sanction, either by firing, uh, by, by doing like severe deductions and so on. So we'll go again from the beginning. Was the job understood? No. No one liberating the procedure? Yes. Oh, sorry. Job understood? Yes. Were the actions as intended? No. 
So if they knowingly violating the procedures, yes. Are procedures clear and workable? Yes. But the error happened, this means that this is a reckless behavior. And also we have to have a final warning and negative performance appraisal. So, in another error, we'll ask the, the, the person who committed the error, or omitted the error, was the job understood? No. Then we'll go this way. Then we'll ask him to pass a substitution test. If it's yes, if there is a history of violations, if it's yes, then the repeated incidents of similar root causes will go to the final warning and negative performance appraisal. If, hist if the person doesn't have history of violating procedures, it will, and it will be a no blame error. So the last part was the job understood if it's no, did the patient pass the contribution substitution test? No. We'll ask defective training or selection, or ask ourselves this question. Was the training defective or uh, selection experience? If it's no, it will be a negligent error. We will write at this time that first warning letter, coaching, greater supervision until behavior is correct. So as I said in the Institute of Medicine report, to err is human, but not to err, to re -air. So we can all make errors, but we shouldn't repeat our errors. So one of the tools that we use in, in, in investigating sentinel events or significant errors is something called root cause analysis, or RCA. It's a systematic process of for identifying the most basic or causal factors and the like variation in the performance. We need to know the causes, what are the root causes of these things. So, it's an intensive, in-depth analysis of problem event, like a sentinel event, to learn more, most basic reasons for the problem, which, if corrected, will minimize the recurrence of that event, hopefully to prevent the recurrence of that event. So the root cause analysis, um, um, as I said, is the earliest point at which action could have been taken that would have reduced the chance of the incident happening. It's a structured process using recognized analytical methods. It enables us or you to ask the questions how and why in an objective way to reveal all the causal factors that have led to a patient safety incident should be used to prevent similar incidents, as I said again, um, uh, from happening, uh, not to apply blame. So when should we do an RCA or a root cause analysis when an incident response process should be determined the level of investigation of action needed? So we do it when we have high risk, as I said, has a high risk incident or a catastrophic incident or a sentinel event, like patient death, permanent loss of function, or a high risk near miss that the recurrence of it might lead to a sentinel event. For example, there is, a, there is a very nice um, paper called RCA squared from the National Patient Safety Foundation. I also advise everyone to read it. It, it, it shows us or it teaches us how to, when to conduct RCA. They have something called severity assessment metrics or, or SAC, which we use to decide whether we will do RCA for this incident or not. So it's a very nice, and it has so many tools to use for the, during the RCA. So we have the Joint Commission's concept of RCA. We have the primary focus, as I said, would be the system and processes, not the people. Um, uh, the progression of the RCA, if you remember the special cause and common cause variation, was it a special cause with a common cause? So, and the approach would be the five whys. There are so many approaches in, in, in the RCA, but here they are mentioning five whys. The goal is to redesign the process that we have for risk reduction. Then will be analysis should be thorough and credible. Then we should have action plan to identify the changes to reduce risk of recurrence. Then we have to have measurement strategy. We have to audit what happened after we did this action plan. Is it controlled? Is it still at risk? Uh, what's happening in the process that we're trying to mitigate the risk in? So these are the steps of conducting RCA. We have to establish RCA, these RCA um, investigation procedures. We have to verify event and define the problem. 
we have to commission or to start uh, the RCA investigations, we have to have an RCA team. Also, this is properly uh, uh, defined in the RCA squared uh, paper. Uh, we have to gather information and do mapping to the event. We have to map the event, what happened. Then we have to identify critical events. Then we have to analyze critical events like cause and effect diagram or Ishikawa diagram. Then we have to identify root causes, add evidence, select best solutions, write the root cause statements or the causal statements like as they call it. Then develop recommendations, write reports, present to commissioning sponsor or the management. So these are some of the tools that we use during RCS. This is for mapping the event. So here we have, if you can see here, we have O2 uh, oxygen tubing attached to the wall, in mattress inflated, patient placed on bed, patient lit a cigarette, then mattress exploded, then patient was burned. So we'll ask ourselves, we'll, after we map the event, we'll ask ourselves why, why did this happen? And we can use the five wise uh, methodology. So why did this happen? Because the patient left the cigarette. So why the patient left the cigarette? Because there is no supervision and so on. And why the mattress exploded and so on. We have to ask one question, then drill down on the answers you receive to get the causal statements or the causes of what happened. So also do we have the change analysis, which is the comparison of what happened at this time and what should have been done And we compare what, what went wrong, what was the difference at this time. And if you remember the Swiss cheese model or the hazard barrier and target analysis, we can use it. We have here, for example, this is an example. We have here the dog, which is the hazard. And we have the high fence, which is the barrier. And we have the child, which is the target. I'm not gonna go through a Shikawa diagram, Dr. Abdel Gawad, uh, I think that he illustrated this. But here we put the, 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 the effect of the event, what happened. So we have here wrong drug administered, hydromor hydromorphone instead of morphine. We have here the classes, fatigue scheduling, training, communication, process procedures, environment, equipment barriers. So related to barriers, we had lack of warning in concentrated op opiate packages. For the environment, we have lookalike packaging. In the training, we have uh, product used infrequently in ED, communication, drug name, confusion, and so on. I think it's very clear and it's commonly used in, in, in our environment. I have four questions. So just if I can pause sharing and get the questions. So I will answer these questions, Dr. Mustafa, by the end of this presentation. There is also the timeline of the incidents. We have here the timeline and timetable or sequence of events. It has to be sequenced since, for example, the patient admission till the incident happens. So as I said, why we are conducting um, RCAs, um, as I said, RCA is an important tool for organization to use in identifying and acting on systems failures. And this is uh, very important that Poorly conducted RCAs may not be accur accurately identified the root causes and can have adverse effects on the organization. So that's why RCAs should be very thorough and very like strict to the point. <clears throat> and I have a problem with my uh, with my screen. Sorry for that. I have to stop share and share again.
So as I said, for the process of RCAs, we have to agree facts of the event, then we have to establish causality and know the causal statements or the causal factors of the, of the, of the sentiment event or the event that happened. And step three, produce action plan. Then of course we'll monitor. And finally, a good RCA is one that identifies all the contributory factor or the contribution causes, leading to more robust systems and processes, addresses all key emergent features, not just root causes, share effective ways to reduce the chances of similar mishaps recurring elsewhere within or without the organization. So that's it for the RCA. We'll go into another very important tool which commonly used and it's mentioned in Janet Brown uh, book for, for C preparation for CPHQ, which is the FMEA or failure modes and effects analysis. So in, in general or in a very high level, it's a tool used for proactive risk assessment and it's better to be used or commonly used for a new processes or redesigned process. So these are the sequence or the process flow of how to conduct an FMEA. So first, we have to define the purpose and scope of FMEA. So first, they have, we have to select it before defining the purpose and the scope. We have to select it based on, as I said, it would be much more better if you have, for example, uh, a new um, EMR module, a new system that you're going to implement, um, uh, a new service that you're going to open. If you're going to open a very specialized ICO like stroke unit, uh, we have to conduct um, FMEA before you have this uh, interaction or you have this running. Then second thing, you have to form a team, team of experts, of course. Then you have to map and understand the process. You have to have this flow chart, which was discussed by Dr. Abdel Gawad. Then we have to list all potential failures for each step. I will take each process step and list all potential failures. Then we have to identify the causes for each failure. Then list all potential effects of each failure mode, then assign severity frequency and um, uh, assign severity, frequency and likelihood of detectability. Then we monitor assigned detection rating, then we calculate RPN, RPN is the multiplication of severity, frequency and detection. Then we will take action to eliminate reduce the high risk failures. Then we will monitor the effectiveness of the redesign process. So as I said, the first step will be defining the purpose and the scope. The second step will be the team, and the team should be the, school, the closest to the process. The team leader or facilitator must understand FMEA concepts. Most probably, we will be the facilitators um, or the team leaders. Um, um, so just in time, FMEA training is necessary for all team members. So you have to, to do it just right before you start your FMEA. And during the, during the course of the FME, you have to, to re-educate the, the team on this. And also a record that must be assigned to document the process. For mapping, also the rules of, of, um, of load charting was, was discussed with Dr. Abdel Gawad, or presented to you with Dr. Abdel Gawad. So I'm not going to go through it. Then we will list the potential failure modes. Then, as I said, identify the potential causes then the effect, then we assign severity. And we're using here the, the, the JCI um, reference for, for FMEA. This is from JCI, the, the, this scale is from JCI. For example, if you have, uh, for severity, if you have a moderate system problem, may affect the patient, it will take two or three. If we have terminal injury, uh, injury or death to patient, other customer, it will take eight, nine or 10. If this will cause major injury to the patient or other customer, to be seven, and so on. Same for the probability. If it's remote, no known occurrence, it will take one, which the probability is one in 10,000 cases. Um, if it's moderate, like one in 200 cases, it will take five and six, five or six. If it's very high, documented, almost certain that, that, that it will cause an effect, or one in 20, Cases it will happen, it will take either nine or 10. Then the detectability is the ability of the, of the staff working in this area or the system to capture this failure. So if it happened, would it be easy to be detected? If it's certain to detect nine out of 10 times, then it will take a score, it's an opposite one. If it's nine out of 10 times, it will take one. 
if I'm almost certain to miss zero out of 10 times, to take either nine or 10. Some, some guidelines or some references, they don't use detectability, which is okay. Then as I said, we'll, connect, we'll calculate the risk priority number, which is occurrence times severity or likelihood times impact times detectability. Then we'll have something called criticality index. Then we'll start prioritization. These, these RPNs will work from the highest to the lowest, or some people select to work on the high or extreme only. Then we'll take actions to eliminate or reduce the high risk failure modes and we we'll identify performance measures to monitor effectiveness. So we, now we'll reach the last part of our presentation, which is the patient safety culture. As you know, CPHQ facilitates assessment and development of organization patient safety culture. It's, um, it's um, advised, advised to, to have um, this patient safety culture assessment at least once per year, even by accreditation standards. Um, so um, let me walk you through what do we do or, the, or the, what are the, the safety culture surveys. So we have here AHRQ survey, which we commonly use. Also we are part of the, of the Saudi Patient Safety Center. We are, I think all of us are participants, all the branches are participating in this initiative. We, uh, we, they, we submit our data or we, they open the survey for us and we, they encourage us to, uh, to participate with at least 50% of, uh, of our staff in, in, in this survey. Then they do the analysis and we receive the analysis, then we put the action plan and so on. So, but there are many other resources than the AHRQ. We have, for example, the University of Texas Safety Attitudes Questionnaire, which is called SAC, SAQ. Is another tool that helps healthcare organization measure caregiver attitudes about six patient safety related domains, compare our, themselves to other organizations, prompt interventions to improve safety attitudes, and measure effectiveness of, the, of these interventions. So the domain scales are teamwork, climate, job satisfaction, per, perception of management, safety, climate, working conditions, and stress recognition. There is also another, another tool to be used for, for uh, culture of safety or, or culture of safety assessment, patient safety culture assessment. It's physician practice patient safety assessment. It's an interactive assessment tool for evaluating medication safety, handoffs and transitions, surgery, basic procedure, personnel qualifications, and competence, practice management and culture, and patient education and communication. So CP attitude and binary settings can use the PPSA to gain specific ideas to improve patient safety, conduct data comparison, and enhance organization and provide an awareness of patient safety issues. So benefits from assessing a patient safety culture of the organization is, as I said, to diagnose the current, current culture and tech changes over time. So as I said, we do it once, at least once per year. And to raise the patient safety awareness, provide the opportunity for internal and external benchmarking, prioritize quality strategies. And that's it. Thank you so much. Any questions? I have a question from Dr. Mustafa. Dr. Mustafa, I'll let you talk. You can talk at the tomb, sir. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Ahmed. Alaikum assalam, Dr. First, thanks a lot for you and for Dr. Abdul Jawad for this uh, valuable orientation in a very limited time. Uh, I was just asking about the RCA uh, uh, resource or reference you talked about. Here, some, uh, some people was asking about it. It's called RCA squared, RCA squared by two. So RCA, and it's from the National Patient Safety Foundation. And you will find it on uh, on the IHI uh, website, Institute of Healthcare Improvement. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other question?
So thank you, thank you so much for being with us for the whole day. I hope this was uh, beneficial to you, and inshallah will help you if, if some of you are planning to to get CPHQs. So best of luck, inshallah. And this is the start. We'll be having a very comprehensive education program in the in the coming year, inshallah. And this, as I said, this is just the start. Thank you so much.